Yes, it seems to be working this time. <laughs> Hallelujah. I just couldn't, I wouldn't be able to do the recording otherwise. Just as in the previous episode, Alex was telling me, we nailed the sound. And like, yes, we nailed it. And of course, the following one. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's, there's a new issue arising. The curse of the sound engineer. He's as tall as me. He shares the same name as me, almost. Uh, and you heard his name many, many, many times. And he's finally on the show. Paolo. Hi, Paolo. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> very, very good. I'm so happy to be doing this with you. Obviously, I have to, of course, uh, address the elephant in the room. Alex, where is Alex? <laughs> Alex is taking a break. And so I have decided under his control, that he's controlling my life, but are you Alex controlling my life? You will be listening to this, uh, that I will take a uh, rotating co-host for a bit. As soon as I say that, I realize that uh, probably uh, people will be uh, bombarding me with emails about, can I come? Can I be on the show? Uh, so I've already lined up quite a few people, guys. Uh, and Paolo, of course, I, I wanted to do it with Paolo for ever we've been talking about it he's a very good friend of mine for context uh we've been knowing each other for a, a while we met through our better halves we've even actually traveled together we've never been in a plane together we haven't no. but we've been in a helicopter together we have it was very cozy <laughs> yeah as i said or did i say that he's as tall as me so imagine two giants in the front of a helicopter and of course there's a third guy who was the the pilot you remember he was he was he was controlling the the yolk with his knees. You remember he that? He was, wasn't he? He was he was filling in some paperwork while he was flying. <laughs> yes, I and, think. And he was doing he was doing the narration of of the island in St. Lucia where we were flying over, not <laughs> even looking out the window. So he's done this so many times. Yes. He didn't need to look out the window, he didn't need to look at the dials, he was just filling out some paperwork. <laughs> exactly. For probably for his next flight or something. Yeah. It absolutely. was it was fantastic. Uh, so so we flew we flew we flew um uh, together. Uh I, I mentioned Alex, I just wanted to to do a shout out quickly before we get into the proceedings i wanted to give a shout out to will alex brother speedy recovery uh, will uh, will has been also um, a guest co-host on this show uh, that was pre before covid i think yeah before covid i'm losing track of time or maybe i'm just getting uh, old so um paulo is discovering how this show is being run we've been having uh, <laughs> difficulties with the sound as you understood for the past 20 minutes uh so let's do this i just want to tell you both good luck we're all counting on you I think, Paolo, the people that need luck are also the people in Dubai, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, they don't need an airport anymore. They just need a port. You know? <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, they, they, everything is extravagant in Dubai. So they, now they have uh, jet-powered yachts. I mean, I don't know. That, that, that Fly Dubai 737 on, at uh, Dubai Airport, that, that image, you probably have seen it, guys. If you haven't, just Google it or go on TikTok or on Instagram. It's quite something. Right. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being on that plane? And if you'd slept through the flight and weren't aware of what the, was going on with the weather, and suddenly you come into Dubai, looking out the window, and normally you just see sand, and you look out the <laughs> out the window, and all you see is water. You'd be wondering where you're landing. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah just crazy, right? Yeah. For context, we're recording this on April the eighteenth, twenty twenty four. So that just happened. I think it was two days ago. There was two subsequent. Mm -hmm. uh, storms i don't know even how to call them i think they got like two years of rain in a day and a half or something i yeah. mean it, it it it's quite staggering uh and and and, and indeed there was a um, part of the dubai airport apron was underwater that image I, i'm not sure do you think the guy identified as a seaplane suddenly or maybe because that's the most logical reason maybe another part of the apron or maybe one of the runways wasn't underwater and then he was just trying to get there, right? I think so. I, I didn't look, yeah, look absolutely. it up. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but what's, what's really weird, I was, I, was, I was reading some stuff this morning and it was talking about you know, all the passengers that have been stuck there pretty much for 48 hours. Yeah. You know, the, the terminal's now running out of food because they can't get food into the terminal. Because what? All the, um, yeah, all the roads know. into the airport are still underwater. No so way. there's no way of getting any any food in. But they were saying that um, some of the flights uh, that had come in had been diverted to DWC instead. And then you'd see pictures of that, and it's only, what, 10 miles down the road? And, and it doesn't look like it's rain there at all. 
Oh, yeah. I think it's gone up towards Abu Dhabi and then across the border into Oman as well. Oman, DWC, yeah. I've, re- I've read that. DWC as, as well. is south of Dubai. Have you been to? No, you've not been to that airport, DWC either, right? No. It was supposed to be the next Dubai airport and then it got basically stalled and it's still. I think there's a. A few Russian airlines that fly there, and that's pretty much about it. And, and cargo, obviously. And cargo, yeah. Uh, yeah, and cargo. But yeah, so uh, look, it's going to be, again, very hot and very dry. So I'm sure that water will uh, will disappear or is disappearing very quickly. Still not fun. So I wish them luck. Um, and uh, hopefully not a lot of people got hurt. Maybe some property damages as much as they've they've gotten. I, I heard that in Oman, at least, there was a few people that, did have, that have not been located. So hopefully, let's hope for the best. Fingers crossed. Yes, and and uh, so now uh, Dubai uh, DXB uh, requires a seaplane rating, right? This is uh, this is the f- <laughs> future. It could be the new route for Trans Moldavian. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, we you've done that as well, yeah. right? Well, we, we share. Uh, you know, Paolo is not only a friend. We we share a lot of travel stories. He's been listening to the podcast almost since the beginning. You've been traveling. A lot. That was reason number one I wanted you because you have all these stories and we'll get to, to that. The other reason I wanted you to inaugurate this uh, chapter of uh, Alex Less um, era of this show for a little bit. There's also like some circumstance. It happened that we just did basically the same trip, almost, uh, without even concerning. We, we, did, we were not talking to each other. It just happened that we went both to Cambodia at roughly the same time with different routes, which is what we're going to explore today. So I I found it perfect to actually talk about it because in the last episode, as our audience uh, will know, I I, I left it completely open as this mystery as where I was uh, going. Nobody got that, but a lot of people understood with whom I was traveling because I've been obsessed with the new Abu Dhabi airport. So obviously, guys, I took Etihad. And I stopped at Abu Dhabi. Shout out to Frank Lozel. You were the first one to actually <laughs> send me a message probably just a minute after I, I released the show. You go, you're using Etihad, you're going to Abu Dhabi. Yeah, right. uh, yes, I am. So that's what I did. Another reason, completely coincidental, uh, that uh, we're doing this Cambodian episode, not only Cambodia, because you've been to Vietnam. We'll get to that as well. Uh, <laughs> the other reason, completely coincidental, during the past four weeks until last week. So maybe basically when we were in Cambodia, when you and me were in Cambodia, and we didn't meet guy, by the way, guys, we, no. we were, again, the same time, but uh, just by a few days apart, the show layovers was number one for four weeks in a row in the aviation uh, charts in Cambodia. So I don't know if you, if anyone in Cambodia knew we were coming, you, Paolo and me, and they were starting listening to this show, but thank you very much to everybody there. And I hope you're going to appreciate what we're going to say in this show. So maybe let's, Start with you, Paolo. Uh, you don't work in the travel industry no. anymore <laughs> no. because you've been working at some point at Heathrow. That's right. So uh, 16 years ago, I left Heathrow. But prior to, prior to that, I was at Heathrow for eight years uh, working in duty-free retailing. So uh, not working with airlines or anything like that. But yeah, that's that was my, my trade. I, uh, I looked after a number of duty-free stores at Heathrow. So T1, T2, T3, and T5. Never worked in T4. But yeah, I, I had uh, eight glorious years at Heathrow. Eight? I didn't Great fun. That. Yeah, yeah, eight years. Yeah, met lots of celebrities as they were passing through. Was involved in day one opening of T5. Hold on, before you go, do celebrities actually buy duty free? Uh, not really. Ah. No. <laughs> no. Uh, although saying that, I had one famous customer, which I'll talk about uh, maybe a bit later. Um, but huh. as you know now, when you go into airports, you walk through security and you're forced through a duty-free store. There's no yeah. way of bypassing it. So everyone has to walk through. Irrelevant of who you are, you know, you could be, you know, the, the King of Jordan or, uh, you know, uh, Joe Public and, and you walk through that store. And if you're working in that store, you're going to you're going to see them. Um, the the in-house photographers that work for the press that are based at Heathrow, you'd see them a few minutes beforehand and then you knew that someone uh, VIP was was coming through. So you always kind of got a, a couple of minutes heads up that, yeah, someone famous was walking through the door. So, uh, guys, so that you know, I don't have a lot of notes because it's a whole point. I wanted to have a conversation. I'm learning this right now. And so I want to ask you about this. Um, I, I know you have, in, I mean, you. Heathrow has in-house photographers, but yep. do they get tipped? Is it official? As yes. in, do they, or because let's say you are a celebrity, Paolo, you yep. don't want to be welcomed. I know there's the Windsor Suites, so you can bypass the yep. on arrival, but otherwise, 
do he throw like shares names of like celebrities or BA or other like how does it work? Do you know? I, I have no idea. It it, it must leak. Um, must, yeah. Or maybe celebs give it away with certain things I do. I mean the the time that I was working at Heathrow was probably before even the likes of Twitter, et cetera, came out. So there, there was no way of photographers knowing, but they, they must have got information from the airline somehow. I, I can't say how, because I don't know, but it was just coincidental that they would be there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you were, so you were saying, so not only that, and then uh, you, so T5, you worked there as well. So you saw yeah, the opening. So, yeah. So I was involved. So T5 opened in the March of, God, that's going back. <laughs> 17 years ago so it opened in the march um and i i kind of uh, arrived on scene in the january when it was still a building site so i was invited um, involved in sort of the fit out of the shops and the, the filling up of the the duty-free stores the five stores that they've got there um so yeah the, those the couple of months beforehand i was there in my uh, hard hat and my safety goggles and my safety boots and it was still a building site and yeah you're wow. sort of filling stuff up and what have you and uh, yeah it was just a building site and then sort of two weeks before um, it opened, it was handed over to the airport authorities and um, the police came in with all their police dogs and sniffed the place out. And then they they literally made landside and airside secure. Um, yeah. But prior to that, you had to go in sort of a, and then sign in like, as you would in any building site anywhere in the world. As long as you were not involved in the the luggage system, because no, that was nothing like... to do with baggage. Not my <laughs> not my bag whatsoever. Pardon the pun. Uh, wasn't involved, but yeah, that that morning when things started to go wrong, you became aware very quickly that things were starting to go downhill. Were you there? Yeah, it was there on opening day. Yeah. Oh my God! Because for those either too young to remember or uh, do not live in the UK, you might not know, but that was the big thing when T five, the latest terminal, opened. It was a grand opening and then everything broke down in terms of luggage. Like it was a brand new system, super smart, whatever, and obviously didn't work. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, I, I remember walking landside um, mid-afternoon to go home because I'd, been, I'd started on an early shift and the baggage, you've never seen anything like it. It was just piled <laughs> up everywhere. It was, it was like some form of, you know, uh, lost luggage office from the last 30 years just bags piled up everywhere it was crazy and oh dear yeah <laughs> oh dear oh well uh look we'll start with with ethro in a in a minute but i want of course to do this which we do in every episode and that's for again can i that's the intro music <laughs> Why did he start mid-music? That's my fault, actually. Yeah, because I was testing the sound when we were doing... Guys, I'm going to add the music in post. That's easier. Let's pretend the music is currently happening. Uh, and this is how it happens. It's going to be very easy to do. Uh, so, Ethro. This is where we both started our journey to uh, Cambodia. I mean, you, Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, so what we're going to do here, we're going to compare notes. So we're going to go almost chronologically uh, yeah. through that journey. But I want to start with Ethro uh, because, I mean, you've worked there, but it's been a long time. So I'm going to ask you this very simple question. Do you like Ethro? <laughs> do you know what? I uh, Listening to your podcast, I share I share your, your love of Gatwick more than I do Heathrow. Uh, yeah. It's quicker. It's less hassle. Yeah, it's just it's it's a better environment. The, the 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 people at the airport at Gatwick, I think, are friendlier. The security teams will talk to you while you stood in the queue. They manage the queues better, and you just you just through, and it just it's a better experience. Yeah, and and and, and I, I was I was at uh, T four to start because I was flying Etihad. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna preempt uh, my description of my trips to say that I will not describe Etihad and Abu Dhabi. Sorry, guys, I know you've been waiting for this forever. Not uh, on this episode, because there's so much we want to talk about about Southeast Asia, including uh, where we stopped. Uh, there are some shared uh, airports, so it's going to be for the next episode. But I still started at um, Ethro and T4, which is uh, the home for Etihad. And that T4, man, it, it seems almost like Ethro is oh, oh, ashamed of it. If, even if when you look at the plans of the future development of, of how Ethro will look like in 200 years because of the speed they're going, they're not doing nothing. But, you know, they, they almost hide it. It's still there, but on the grand plans, you have these night renderings of how Ethro T5, T5X, T6, everything. And then the T4 is kind of this abundant bit on the side. They don't know what to do with it. It. And even when you're there, I mean, it's okay, if, but it feels really like a mid-sized town 
terminal, you know, like uh, I know that it was supposed to be, it was a domestic uh, terminal only um, when it started, which explains it, but it it's really not the greatest terminal in the world. Uh, but it was okay. I mean, it was okay. You were at T2, I think, this time. That's right. Time. Yeah. So I, our, our trip out uh, to Vietnam took us via Bangkok. So we flew out with Thai Airways. Why Thai Airways? Was it, were, were you, did you have a choice? Were you thinking about other airlines or not? Yeah. We we could have gone. We could have gone Middle Eastern. We could have gone Singaporium. We could have gone Eva Air. Uh, a number of a number of different choices. Um, generally, when I travel, I travel economy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but for this this trip, we decided. You know what? We're going to go business class. Nice. It's, it's just 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 do business class. So I was I was playing around with prices, and we knew the day that or the days we wanted to fly. And looking at Thai, Thai was half the price of. Wow the three Middle Eastern big boys, uh, Singapore Airlines and Eva Air. So it was like, okay, well, do you only get half the service? How, <laughs> how does it work? You know? and, I, and I've flown Thai before. I flew, I've flown Thai a number of times, um, economy, and I've always thought they were pretty good. Uh, yeah. I've never had any complaints. I thought, yeah. you know what, let's let's just give them a go. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was it. That was the, that, that was the, 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 the caveat was, was price. Yeah, exactly. But because you are smarter than I am overall, uh, you always, because there's a huge difference between you and me, you plan your trip in advance and I'm yeah. a very last minute. So by the time I was looking, because as, as I said, I booked between the last two episodes. So basically I booked four weeks in advance. By four weeks in advance, you don't get a lot of good deals. And Etihad was actually the, 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 the better deal at that time. Uh, I looked at, like you, I looked at uh, Eva Air because they do a, a London, Bangkok, uh, nonstop direct. I've even looked actually, you know, at uh, Cathay Pacific because uh, you can also uh, join uh, Cambodia via Hong Kong, but there's not as much service. I mean, Bangkok to Cambodia is like every five minutes, it looks like, mm-hmm. whereas it was, but it was still quite expensive. And, and Thai was, I was outpriced. I was basically for me, it was I was outpriced. Obviously, I wanted to see the new Abu Dhabi <laughs> airport, but obviously for such a long flight, I would have rather to have a, a nonstop. But, uh, but Thai, so how was... Um, uh, how was T2? Because you, you don't often fly from T2 yourself, I think. No, generally it's T5 or out of Gatwick. Did you, uh, so, did you, did you like it? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it was, do you know what, actually? We walked into the terminal and as, as a sort of walk in, it was busy. And I was like, oh God, here we go. We're going to stand in a queue for 15 minutes to check in, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we saw the, uh, the Thai desks and uh, saw the queue and then uh, then we saw the business class desk so we walked around and, uh, and yeah. sort of on the back wall of the check in yes and there was no one there yeah. there there, we, there were no passengers whatsoever there's one guy sitting there playing with his phone looking like he just wanted a passenger so of course we rock up and uh, he was really chatty really friendly he noticed straight away that we were connecting through Bangkok and we only had an hour and a half in Bangkok. Mm-hmm. And he's like, oh, yeah, you need a, a fast transfer. So um, he put a tag on our bag. I forget the exact wording. It was um, fast transfer or speedy transfer. So you, the, the baggage handlers at Bangkok knew they'd got to get that bag off and sent somewhere else very quickly. Um, gave us all the information and he said to us, uh, unfortunately, the Singapore Airlines lounge that we normally use is closed at the moment for refurbishment. Oh. I was like, okay. So he said, you've got a you've got a choice. You can use any of the Star Alliance lounges in T2. And he said, however, I recommend the United one. Ah, uh, good. He so, gave you a good recommendation. Yeah. So um, we walked through. We went through fast track security. Again, no one there. Straight through. And then bypassed all the shops and restaurants and, and headed straight to the United lounge. Uh, through that, through and- that, through that underground tunnel that goes forever. <laughs> Yeah, the one that they couldn't be bothered to put the electric train in. Right, you know, you, walk, right. walk, walk yourself. You're going to be on a flight for 12 hours. Stretch your legs now. That's <laughs> that's the mentality, right? <laughs> that's Sometimes, this is what sometimes I'm like, and we'll go on a, a little bit about this a bit later, but when you compare internationally, uh, it's, really, it's an okay airport. And, uh, let's not say it's dire, but I'm, I'm sometimes I'm like, what are we doing? Where... What are the improvements that we keep getting promised? And the, 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 that's why I said earlier, like 200 years before anything gets done, because that, like you said, that corridor is supposed to be a train eventually. But when? I don't know. <laughs> and yeah, anyway. So, but you were also departing from T2B, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah okay, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. He said that, you know, the long haul flights all go from there. So he said, yeah, go straight down to United Lounge. So we sauntered down the, um, 
the endless corridor that is down to T2B that just keeps going and going and going. Um, the travelators were working. The last time I went there, they weren't. No and way. you had to just walk. So yeah. at least this time they were working. So <laughs> get to the other end, up the escalators, and straight into United Lounge. And, and I have to say, I was I was pleasantly surprised. Now, bearing in mind the Singapore Airlines Lounge was closed. So you've got, um, I think there were two or three Singapore Airlines flights going at roughly the same time as our flight. Oh, I see. So, and they're all 380. So, you got all of those guys in there. You got the Eva Air flight going at the same time. They were all in there. I think there were two Air India flights. One of those was delayed by hours. Um, so, they were all in there. And I forget there was something, somebody else flying at the same time. So, it was busy, but there were seats available. Yeah, good. The, the team in there, I have to say, were really, really good. They were really on it. So, there's obviously a lot of demand for food. Directly, literally, a, a tray of food had finished. They brought the next one out. So, it got topped up all the time. Plenty of guys behind the bar filling up your glasses of wine and champagne and beer. Directly, you finish your food, they were taking the plates away. So, the place looked nice and tidy. So, it was it was really good. I, I, was, I was pleasantly surprised. It's a very good lounge. I, 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 I'd even say it's probably the best lounge at T2, actually. I mean, the... The Singapore Air Lounge, I've done it uh, 10 years ago. It's very nice. I've even done once the the first class one, which is obviously super nice. Uh, United actually has also like a private section for uh, their, what's the name, Global something now, I forgot the name, which is their tier above, um, which is a door. You don't see it, but it's a, it's a door at the very back. I've never been there, but it's a very nice big lounge. And I love all the... Uh, Decoration with uh, United planes from the um, from the past, their their history. So it's it's a, it's a it's a it's a good lounge. It's not all, often that I say good things about United, but actually um, they're they've been in the past few years getting higher in my um, esteem. So I, I I I do enjoy that lounge and. Um, and then uh, the flight. So you you said three eighty. Is that correct? That's what. I uh, know. So Thai with oh. Thai, it was triple uh, seven. So all the uh, Thai A three eighties have been retired. Oh, They're I all... didn't know that because the, yeah. oh, the last time I flew, I flew uh, Thai was the three eighty. Was probably back in twenty sixteen. So it's quite a while. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So they didn't bring them back in service after COVID. So okay. they're all sitting at the end of the runway at Bangkok Airport, getting dusty. I didn't see them when I because also yeah <laughs> hint hint I also landed at Bangkok. So oh okay okay. So so how was that? So where you because for someone who's never or not really done business class, especially in a long haul, yeah, was it up to your? I mean, maybe, did you have any expectations, and did it reach those expectations? Or? Yeah, so of course you, you you do a bit of research, and the internet makes that very easy. So you you go on YouTube and see if someone's done a review of Thai business class. Of course, loads of people have. Um, yeah, you yeah. go on to Seek Guru, etc. So there's there's plenty of places to to reference it all, and 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 the feedback generally was it's a little bit tired. Oh, and um, that was the feedback that you get from the yeah, videos, etc. But you know, you go in with a with an open mind. You know, you read a TripAdvisor review. Some people say things are great. Some say things are bad. You, you take them with a you know pinch of salt, and you yeah, make your own mind course, up yeah. based on your own experience. Uh, so we we got on um, the business class on the triple sevens divided into two. So you've got the first sort of from the first door to the second door, and then a chunk of from the second door into economy. Um, going out, we were in that first part. So you go in the first door and it's just business class travelers so straight away you're shown to your seat sit down the menu's there um they brought around drinks which speaking to you uh last week before we uh before we we, we did the podcast but uh we were a bit disappointed that there was no champagne but i, I think you came up with the the the, the idea that, that, that the champagne is not served from heathrow because of vat yeah some um, airlines do not pay the tax yeah, yeah so there was no tax. champagne so it was fruit juice or iced tea which, which one did you? Which one did you get? I went for the iced tea. I've <laughs> never <laughs> had iced tea before, and it's really nice. I, I I drank loads of it while we were away, but the the cabin crew really really friendly. They got everybody on board really quick actually because we were we didn't start boarding until our departure time, uh, so okay. there was oh. a, a delay. Okay, um, but everybody was on board within twenty minutes. Oh, and, nice! Um, and we pushed back, and and we were. Uh, we were, you know, chugging away down the taxiway down towards the down towards the western end of the airfield. But yeah, the, the cabin crew came round, took our orders for food, and bought some uh, some little nibbles round before we we took off. Uh, so that was really really nice. So yeah, first impressions though, it it was a bit tired. The sort of um, the area where you sort of can store stuff, which for the person behind is where their feet go. Um, yeah, yeah. 
it it kind of had this wooden effect laminate around it, but it was all a bit bit old and not looked after. Yeah. Um, but other than that, it was absolutely fine. Of course, I started instantly started having to play with the seats because it was all you know new to me, and so oh, how does the flatbed work? And you know how can you require everything else? So I'm I'm fiddling around, um, <laughs> and and but it was it was it was good. Um, plenty of leg room stretch it being able to stretch out is a is a great thing when you're yeah. you know, nearly two meters tall it's yeah, we're the same our guys were the same height as i said earlier we're, we're ne ne exactly the same height he's one of yeah. the rare person i can see eye to eye without doing any kind of contortion uh we also share almost the same birthday so we're really, we really do, close. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely so uh yeah that was great the the, the funny thing was they came around with the uh, the free slippers that you get Yeah. Um, and I have size 12 feet. Um, and so sort of the last quarter of my feet weren't actually in a slipper it's whatsoever. Same, man. It's always the case with me. Yeah. I'm also like 12, 13. So always, especially with airlines, uh, anything basically east, yeah. the slippers are always, always way too small for me, which is fine. I Well... But yeah, <laughs> I mean, thankfully they didn't bring around pajamas because that would have been a comical moment. <laughs> I mean, you know, it would have been like a crop top and hot pants. <laughs> Very spice girly. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, so you, did you? So did you enjoy? Did you enjoy the food as well? And, and because yeah. I, I, I'm asking, so you know, you, you mentioned earlier the reviews that you see online, especially the YouTube. And one thing that you're, you're very right about pointing out is that. When you've been doing business class for a long while, you obviously, it's not that you become blasé, some people do, but you become more critical, mm -hmm. whereas a person who does it very seldomly will appreciate things that you're like, oh, why is it, you know, so I, 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 I always strive to not becoming that blasé person. So did you... Did you enjoy the, the, was it the food and the attentiveness of the crew? Was it the, nice throughout? The, yeah, the attentiveness of the crew. The, the lady that was serving us uh, served us throughout the flight. She didn't. She didn't appear to go and have a rest. So oh, wow. you know, the flight's eleven hours, and every time I was sort of awake, she was there. Um, so that was really good. The food was great, um, and that's one of the reasons actually I chose Thai as well. Um, even when you travel economy. Every time I've traveled with them, I've had a prawn curry, a Thai prawn curry, and it's been amazing. This time round, it was a choice of chicken, beef, and salmon. I had salmon, really, really good. And it was, it, it didn't taste like airline food. It tasted fresh. It, it tasted like something out of a restaurant. It was really well presented and, and really good quality. And I think, I'm trying to think what else we had. There were, there were, I think, four or five courses for our main dip, for our main meal. Oops, you mean, after, oh, wow. Oh, wow. An hour after takeoff. And, you know, it was a, a flight at 10 o'clock at night. So we'd already eaten in the lounge. Going to get my money's worth here. I, eaten in the lounge and then ate again on the flight <laughs> sort of two hours later. So really full, but the food was was good quality. Nice. Um, and then they, they cleared the plates really quickly because they know people want to then get some sleep. Um, so I was like, right, okay. I got to put my flatbed down. So I put my flatbed down, got my stuff ready, and then sort of turned around. And the, the, the flight attendant lady was there. And she's like, would you like me to make your bed for you? And it's like, you make my bed for me? This is, <laughs> this is, this is kind of weird. So she made the bed up and everything else and then, and then got a few hours sleep. Oh, that's nice. I love, I love that because it's true that we tend – those uh, that are road warriors or flight warriors tend to forget how nice it is sometimes. I, I still – All these years, I still find it sometimes awkward. I'm like, no, nah, that's fine. I'm going to do it myself. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but it's nice. It's still, you know, it's part of the service. It, it's it's nice. Anything else you want to mention about that flight? Or uh, no, it was it was relatively quiet. We got into, despite the fact that we left Heathrow late, we got into Bangkok 25 minutes early. Nice. Um, second meal was served a couple of hours before the flight. The only the only criticism I'd have if I was being picky, the in-flight entertainment wasn't that great. As in terms of choice or in terms of for the UI and the way it was working? The choice. Yeah. Um, you know, they had the Barbie movie on, which really isn't my cup of tea. Uh, <laughs> but then I, th I I misread it. I thought I had Oppenheimer and I haven't seen Oppenheimer. So, and I, I'd, I'd looked to see what was on the flight yeah. so I could yeah. see Oppenheimer. It's like, great, I'm not going to watch it before I go away. When I turned it on, it was the making of the movie, not oh, the no movie way. itself. And it's like, oh. right. So they had the making of, but not the movie itself. Not the movie itself, oh, no. Crying out loud. That's... So it's like, oh, it's like disappointing. <laughs> Thankfully, I'd loaded up my iPad with loads of stuff from Netflix and Apple TV, yes. etc. So tons of stuff to watch. 
You're smart. This is always what to do. Yeah, I, uh, long haul flights. Uh, often have an iPad, or even sometimes you know, simply on my phone. Like tomorrow, I'm flying uh, to Nice, which is only like a two hour flight. I already downloaded a few things. I have the Kindle, the phone. And I was like, if I don't want to read, at least I can watch something. Uh, obviously, there's never going to be IFE in a flight in Europe, but I'm just saying it's a, it's a good it's a good policy to always have stuff downloaded on a on a device just in case. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you get stuck in Dubai for two days, you've got an iPad, you can watch some stuff, right? <laughs> yes. Or uh, nothing to do that. I remember once that saved me, nothing to do with flying, but I was um, in an emergency room in an A&E in Paris, 2017, for six hours, because that had fallen, and uh, because it was an emergency room, I was not the priority. Because you know, just my uh, my feet was swollen, and thank God I had my iPad. I watched a binge watch some show. I don't remember which one. It was it was pretty good. Um, so we'll go to Bangkok in a bit because we have contradicting opinions on it. <laughs> let's yeah. let's put it that way because we discussed it. Obviously, guys. We saw each other, it was last Sunday, actually. Was it last Sunday or was it two weeks ago? I forgot now. Two weeks ago, uh, yeah. Two weeks ago, yeah. So we were discussing about our trips and, you know, and that's when I said to Paolo, hey, I want you to be the first of these co-hosts, um, because, not only because we've done the, the, the same trip, which is nice to talk about uh, Cambodia this time, uh, but also simply because you love flying it. Of all these stories, man, it could be, it could be you know, for five episodes, it would not run out of stories. Uh, we'll touch up on some of those at the end, guys. Uh, this is a teaser. So I said I'm not going to talk about the description of Etihad and Abu Dhabi. Again, sorry for those who are expecting it today. Uh, it will be the next episode, which will come probably uh, around in two, three weeks. But, and you know that already, but it was my worst flight ever. The flight from London to Abu Dhabi was my worst flight ever, bar none. It has nothing to do with Etihad. So Etihad was good. That's all I say about Etihad. So really do not take it up on Etihad, but I'm going to explain the little bit of story. In the last episode, you might remember, guys, that I said to Alex when we were just starting recording, I think it's in the recording, that I had a rough night just before. Uh, and that was two days before, two and a half days before I was leaving to Bangkok, like you, to go to uh, Southeast Asia. Um I I had a huge pain in the night. He woke me up like at midnight. I stayed a, 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 a awake for like two or three hours and then I crashed. That morning didn't feel anything. The next, because I'm not going to go into details, guys. I don't want to, it's not a medical show or anything. Uh, the day of the recording of that last episode, nothing. The, the following day, which was a Thursday, nothing. And on Friday, I'm, I was flying on Friday evening, because that's often actually the uh, Middle Eastern carriers, I was flying the evening to Abu Dhabi, uh, I think at 9 p.m. or something. So in the morning, I went to the gym, and after about 15 minutes on the treadmill, I was like, oh, man, I recognize that pain from the other night. <laughs> yeah. So right there, I said, I stop, you know, because I'm like, I'm leaving tonight. So I'm like, I stop. It was literally not the level of pain I had two days prior, but I was like, oh, 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 oh. And I'm, in my head, I'm like, there's no way I'm canceling those holidays. There's no way I'm getting sick. There's just no way. So, you know, I stopped, I go back home, and the whole day I was feeling kind of meh. But I was like, you know what? I'm going to pretend that nothing is happening because there's no way, again, I'm going to cancel this trip or actually or postpone it or whatever. So... I, I'm in the Piccadilly line because I, we went through, we used simply the Piccadilly line. We're flying, as I, as I said earlier, from T4. I was not sitting the whole way through because he I was feeling better standing. It was a back pain. And I was like, okay, uh, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. <laughs> Arrive at the lounge and like I took a cup of champagne, pretending that everything was all right. I sat for like four or five minutes. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to just do a stroll around the lounge, which is not very big because I literally had an issue to, to sit down. Um, but again, like, no way, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to cancel this trip. And so we board, uh, we got into the, it was a three, uh, 380, also in business class. Uh, we had, uh, you know, the spared seat in the middle. So you're two together. And um, basically, I could basically never sit down the whole flight. Uh, so I tried, you, you know, you said earlier <laughs> 
that you tried, you were very happy to try the seat. This is what's usually what you do the first time you're in business class and or the first time you have a new business class. You're like, I want to see how the seat works. And I'm, I'm a kid like you. I'm going to... There was more like I was testing... Okay, so the angle at 72% uh, on the back, would it make it better? No, uh, 69... No, it doesn't. Uh, 53, no, it doesn't. I, I tried all the settings like lie flat, you know, like every single setting possible to see if there was one way that my back wouldn't hurt no way I, every time i was like okay so let me just go for a stroll on the on the ale the, 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 the flight attendants must have been looking at me what is this guy doing uh i'm, I'm very good at hiding the pain so i was like no no it's fine but um i at some point uh i am an hour within the, in the flight i even you know instead of checking the ife because i couldn't focus I was playing, with, you know, they have these silly games like uh, gaming on the, there was yep. some kind of space invaders because I said, okay, maybe if I focus my energy on having to play a game, which is more, you know, involving than just watching passively a movie, I will forget about my pain. Yeah, no, <laughs> if I was, I played five minutes, I probably beat the high score because I was so trying to not think about the pain. Man, it was, it was, it was absolutely horrible. Uh, they served me food. I didn't eat anything. They served me a glass of champagne. It stayed there for the whole flight. I mean, she kept thinking, do you want more? Are you, are you finished with this? And every time I'm like, no, no, maybe leave it. Maybe I'll take it later. No, I, I was just going. There's the, So Etihad 380 has a, a lounge. So it's not like Emirates where it has a bar, but it's a kind of lounge area which separates the first class from the business class. And I was going there and there's, you know, they have this round table with two circles of seats around it. So it makes it really like a, a, a table in a circle. And I was literally walking in circles around that table by myself because that was the only way I could not bother anyone. Because, you know, after a while, I was like thinking maybe the people in the ale will be like, why does this guy keep walking? So I was walking, 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 walking. The, 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 <laughs> there was this very nice flight attendant who was attending the lounge at that time. And... She's like, you're right. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to sleep. So, you know, I, I just want, I want to take a walk. And then she offered me tea and I took some tea and then some coffee. And then I drank like liters of water to no end because at least I say, oh, I'll spend part of the flight in the bathroom. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was, man, it, and, and for the first time, it's also, I will admit it, the flight is what, seven hours? Yeah, for the within that time frame, many times I thought about canceling. I think maybe I'll arrive in Abu Dhabi and I'll have to just backtrack. There's just no way I can do a whole trip if I'm like that. Like it was super painful, not at the level of that. Not, and I don't want to compare pain. You know, maybe you know, uh, there's probably not the the, the pain level of uh, women giving birth or having uh, you know their uh, menstruation every, every. It's really not. I I won't say it's the worst pain po possible, but it's a very weird pain that I had never experienced. And it's very bothersome, uh, especially again, when you sit. Uh, so really the worst, you know, I was even Googling, the Wi-Fi was pretty bad. I was Googling, what kind of pain medication do they have at Abu Dhabi airport? Because I'm like, maybe I can take something to kind of kill me off or something, but no. Uh, so really, you know, your mind goes into stupid territory because you have nothing else to do but think about your pain in a flight. Don't do like me, guys. Never, I should have, because I learned that later on, uh, my doctor, whom I've seen on re upon return of uh, this whole trip, told me, well, if you had more than two hours of pain that night before the podcast, you should have gone to the emergency room. You should have done something about it. And I kind of, because the next day I was fine, I kind of like brushed it off like a stupid person. Like a typical man. Yeah, typical yeah, man. Yeah, ju yeah, just go away. We, we're, not, we're not in pain. We, we, yeah, we're just going to get on with it. <laughs> exactly. Which... I mean, the the good thing, however, is that we landed at Abu Dhabi, and at that time I was still in pain. I didn't sleep at all, you know, so I was completely tired because that was the night for still my our time zone here in the UK. So I spent the night up, basically. We land, and I'm like, oh god, and we go to the lounge, and it's a bit better. I will admit, it's a bit better. And uh, at that time, my mind is focused on discovering Abu Dhabi Airport, the new terminal. I'm like, okay, I'm going to stroll around and look at it. Again, guys, that will be the next episode. Uh, so it kind of, the pain took a second, like a back seat in my head. Uh, to make the story short, when I entered the next flight, uh, I think it was a, it was a Dreamliner. I forgot it was a, a Dash 9 or Dash 10. It doesn't really matter. Uh, oh, Dash 8. Um, I, <laughs> the first thing I, th I think, I'm like, oh, shit, there's going to be another uh, seven, eight hours like this, and I need to sleep. I'm completely 
dead. Uh, I'm also pretending to my better half that I'm fine. Of course, she knows that I'm not. But she's like, no, no, it's fine. We're, no, no. And uh, then, you know, I sit down and I'm like, hmm, it's it's actually better now. So you start having this song in your head, hallelujah. You're like, okay, maybe I'll get through this. And then um, she comes for the pre depart to service uh, for, for a drink and then I'm moving to like it's a new dawn it's a new day it's a new life I'm feeling good I'm not saying like I'm not in pain anymore and by the time we took off and we get that first drink post takeoff uh, I was like, put your hands up in the air, put your hands up. I was ready to do a DJ set in the whole aircraft, you know, but you got up, pump it up. I didn't feel any more pain for the rest of the trip. Nothing. So I got lucky because then nothing for the remainder of my trip. And thank God, because I'm so happy to have done it. It's been on my to-do list, Cambodia, for so fucking ever. But man, uh, yeah, for, for those who want to, it's probably... Some type of kidney stone is not a usual kidney stone. Uh, I'm not going to go into more details. I don't want to go into gory details with anyone because, you know, you might not be prepared for that, guys, listening to this show. But do not, do not fly with that kind of shit. It's really the worst thing possible ever, man. Ever. Ever. Well, were you ever, ever sick in a flight yourself? Never. No, oh. I've never, never, never been ill <laughs> on a flight. Touch wood and long may, may it continue. But you do ask yourself the question of... If you are ill, are you going to be that person that forces the plane to divert? Yeah, that's the other thing. I was mid-flight. Oh. I was really a lot. I mean, it was, you know, I was trying to contort myself in a position. Yeah, I was at some point, I was even like an animal. I was like crouched on the seat. So I had my two feet, you know, like crouched, like mm -hmm. not even sat on the seat because I'm like, maybe if I'm crouching on the seat, uh, instead of sitting on the seat or lying on the seat, it'll be better. I mean, that lasted for like two minutes and I'm like, no, nah, it's not better. I was trying, you know, all types of position and the seats are very comfortable. I can, mm -hmm. none of what I said is about Etihad, but <laughs> man. And uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 it's bad. And, and, and also, like you said, like a man, I didn't want to bother the crew. I mean, anyway, there's no way the crew can give you any kind of medication. First, they don't have it. They have an emergency kit, but they don't have any of like super hard painkillers. Uh, I had like, you know, the usual paracetamol and whatever. Uh, but yeah, no, that didn't do jack shit, I guess. Or maybe it did a little bit, but not to the point of releasing any kind of pain. You know? But do you know, yeah. I'm, I'm really surprised actually they didn't dig a bit deeper into you uh, throughout the flight because of what I'd describe potentially as odd behavior. So you're pacing up around this circle of tables. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're kind of practicing the brace position in your business class seat. I, I, I'm surprised that they didn't come up and say, are, are you really okay? Uh, yeah, yeah no, they, you know? but you know, I play well, you know, you know me, I'm nice. I'm going to smile. No, I'm fine. And can I get a coffee and another tea? And I was, you know, I had, I, I was killing time as well, because at some mm. point you're like, okay, what else am I going to do? I, I'm going to limit my time at my seat. They were worried. I, I was chatting. There's this, the same uh, flight attendant I mentioned. I uh, sadly didn't write down, down her name because she was really nice. We talked about travel for probably an hour because, the, you know, at that point, everybody was sleeping in the, in the yeah. cabin. She was the only one in that bit, and I was the only one as well. So we chatted. Uh, she kept saying, don't you want to sit down? I'm like, no, no I'm fine. <laughs> but yeah, so, and she was very, very nice. And we talked about Cambodia. We talked about, have you been to, what's your favorite city in the world? What's the, you know, stuff like that. And so uh, that made part of the flight very much. But yeah, bad, uh, bad. Uh, you know, the... the on the second flight, when I just tell you, I could have played a DJ set, how, how fine I was, I felt, and how happy I suddenly felt. Uh, that uh, first meal, which uh, I took the pasta, uh, was just, uh, it's probably my head talking, but it felt the best pasta I ever had in my life because I was, was so happy. I was like, this is the best thing I ever had. I was, I was commending the flight attendant, like, oh, this is the best pasta I ever had in flight. Probably was not. But, <laughs> but to your point as well, I'm... This is completely beyond the point of this podcast and then we'll move on. But to the point you understand in these moments of ultra pain, people that are ready to try anything, like including, you know, we heard these stories about oxycotin and all this stuff in the US, like these more powerful painkillers. Because at yeah. that time I would have paid anything to take anything. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I have a strong will, but you, you start thinking about, is there something that is not over the counter that I could get to help me, you know, it's it's yeah. terrible. <laughs> I'm not proud of that, it, but yeah. 
<laughs> it's. It, I mean, I, I've been. You say, have I ever been ill on a flight? Never, never been ill. I've been on lots of flights where the call has gone out for a doctor or a nurse or a paramedic. Yeah. yeah. Um. And you, and you wonder, oh God, what's what's happening? Yeah. Um. In, in fact, one of my uh, one of my uh, favorite, well, not favorite flights, but favorite moments on a flight. Um. I was flying. This is. 18 years ago now, I was flying from Amsterdam to Lima in Peru, mm -hmm. KLM. And uh, the, 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 the whole flight was just comical from start to finish. So we got on the, on the, on the aircraft and it was either a DC-10 or an MD-11. Oh, nice. So old, old aircraft, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so captain comes on and does his, uh, his little announcement. And he said, uh, just to let you know, everybody, this is the oldest aircraft in our fleet. What did he say? Yeah, that? He told us that, right? And he said it was built in 1973. And I'm thinking, this recycled baked bean tin is older than me. And it is going <laughs> to carry me across the Atlantic. So instantly you're kind of, oh, I feel a little bit uneasy. I wish it was a more modern plane. I, I'm sure it's perfectly safe. It's been well maintained, etc. But you, you're on a bit on an edge. Anyway, we, we, we take off and we, we're making our way across the Atlantic. And then... About four or five hours into the flight, the the call comes out, ladies and gentlemen. If there's a doctor, a nurse, or a paramedic oh. on board, can you make yourself known to the cabin crew? And it's like, oh crap, what's going on here? So I'm kind of looking around, and I can't see anything. I can't see any goings on with cabin crew helping a passenger or anything. So I thought oh, I must be in must be in business. Anyway, five minutes past, another announcement comes out. If there's anybody, um, doctor, nurse, paramedic on board, or anybody with first aid training, can you please make yourself known to? And I, oh god, this is this is escalating. Yeah. And and then you start thinking, right? If if it's really serious and we're halfway across the Atlantic, where are we going to stop? <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. <sighs> this is weird. So anyway, then then you see all the cabin crew together having a kind of conflab in one of the um, by one of the emergency doors, all in Dutch. And then they get the flight manifest out and literally they open the flight manifest and, and it's clearly got everyone's names, but their titles. Oh, if there's a doctor, a DR. Yeah. yeah. So literally you see them come running down the gangway and the guy sat immediately behind me, who's busy reading a book that started tapping him on the shoulder. And I said, excuse me, excuse me, you've got to help. You've got to help. And he's like, what, 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 what? And they're like, it says here, you're a doctor. You've got to help. You've got to help. And he's like, I'm a doctor of mathematics. I can tell you the probability of the person dying, but I can't help you in any other way. And then he just carried on reading his book. I'm like, <laughs> so they sort of walk away and they, and, and they sort of stood there for a few seconds, comprehending, thinking, well, if you're a doctor, you must be a medical doctor. But he wasn't. So, uh, so I'm thinking this, this situation is obviously quite dire because they're now looking at the yeah. flight manifest. Yeah. But then we heard nothing more. We heard nothing on the rest oh. of the flight. So you don't, yeah, you don't, I mean, it's maybe better, you know, the outcome. I mean, yeah. 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 But it was just the actions looking through this flight. You know, they get that really long sheet of paper with the sort of the two printed things down the side that come out of a dot matrix printer and, and literally looking down line by line at the titles of the passengers. And yeah, but was, this guy's attitude was just brilliant. He was so blase. Yeah, I'm a doctor of mathematics. I can tell <laughs> the, the probability of the person. That, uh, oh my. God. Ah, uh, dear. Yeah, yeah. We, we talked about it with Alex in a, a long time ago that I think Lufthansa, um, I think it was Lufthansa, has a running list of like of doctors. So you can, as a as a regular Lufthansa flyer, you can actually put your name on that list uh, so that they know immediately within a manifest what the people that are ready to uh, intervene in cases of an emergency on, 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 on board. Yeah, yeah. But it's true that underwater, doesn't uh, doesn't help. There was a what was it? Um, the, the, that's famous Singapore uh, aircraft, Singapore airline aircraft that does the New York Singapore. They had a, a morgue in it. Oh my god! Yeah, I think yeah. Not I think I know. Yeah, there's a morgue. I don't, I, I don't know if it has ever been used, but I know there is one. <laughs> wow! I I'm talking pre-COVID. I know now they have different aircrafts, but probably with the duration of that flight. Although they, they do uh, they do fly over uh, land at some point, but uh, yeah, oh well. Wow. Uh, before we go to Bangkok, uh, uh, a little bit of little piece of trivia. Uh, do you know what animal has the biggest anus in the world? No. <laughs> so most people think that the biggest asshole is a, a blue whale, but actually, for me, the the biggest assholes are people that, and pardon my French here for using these swear words, are the people that use their speakerphone in public. I I I've had that. I mean, more and more in cities, but not only at Heathrow, 
But during the flight, there was this guy, and remember, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't uh, sleep at all, that had his iPhone, Android, whatever that was, so loud, watching God knows what, that I could hear it. And I'm like, man, invest in some freaking headphones. And then again, yeah. at Bangkok, I had people watching TikTok with a full, uh, full loud system. And then also like uh, doing calls, like business calls. I'm like, I don't need to hear the other side of it. I understand that you make a call. I'm not saying you shouldn't make a call. I'm not here to say everybody should be silent. But man, and and, and close to that are, are, are the, not all of them, but the bad influencers, uh, because they, 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 they do pretty much the same thing. But have you have you seen that in your recent trips, or not so much on uh, not so much flying, but man on the tube in London. Oh yeah, my God, it's, oh. just, it's an epidemic, man. Oh, and, and because I, I don't know if you've noticed this, and we we digress slightly away from yeah. flights, but. <laughs> When you're traveling on the tube now, it's so noisy. I don't know what they've done to the rails or the wheels on the train, but it's so loud. <laughs> yeah. So people turn their speakers up even more to compensate for the noise. <laughs> yes. And I'm like, come on. You just want to get hold of the phone and throw it out of the window as you're rattling down the tunnel, you know? It's just, it's, it's crazy. A, a 380 is not the loudest aircraft in the world. Uh, they are louder ones, uh, but it's not now the, 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 the more silent ones. The 350 is more silent. But, I, you know, it's like it's bothersome because it's not like, you know, when you have the, the sound of the engines, at least it's a one, uh, sta it's like static. It stays yeah, the same, yeah. more or less overall. Sometimes a change of power, whatever. But that was like, and I'm like, come on, guys, don't you? Like, and including the guys in the tube, please just have like noise canceling headphones. It should be. Hmm? And I understand that the crew might either not notice because they're in the galley and that doesn't affect them or that they... They hesitate to confront people and I get it, but I'm like, this is, it's just, it feels like an epidemic. It feels like worse than COVID, this thing, and people are just going on their phones all the time. I mean, it's just, yeah. Sorry, I, I had to mention that, and it was a silly joke about the blue whale, but I mean, I really, really dislike uh, that. So let's go to uh, something I dislike, which is Bangkok Airport. <laughs> uh, so why do you dislike Bangkok Airport? What's what's wrong with it? Oh, uh, look, no, I... It's really not on my bottom list of people of people of uh, of airports I do not like. It's I think it's really not where it should be and where it was. Uh, so that airport is pretty new. You know, it was built only in two thousand and six. I think it opened fully yeah. in two thousand eight. So it's, it's pretty new uh, compared to other airports in the region, other hubs like Hong Kong. Or, I mean, Hong Kong was quite recent because of the they changed uh, the location or or Singapore, but it aged very, very quickly. I don't know why. I already felt that the last time I was there was just pre-COVID in 2019 when I flew EVA Air from Bangkok to Amsterdam, actually, not London. And I felt a degradation in how it looked. Maybe it's due to the humidity of the country and maybe, you know, the kind of wear and tear appears more. But, and it feels also that some bits have been left out, not like properly maintained, like it's a bit dirty in a way. I also feel that the the layout is, I mean, I understand they had to build very quickly. So there's these big piers, you know, like an H, you know, like big one, um, G, E, D, A, B, whatever. And it feels like there's not a lot to do. You have like a clusters of lounges, but yeah. there's not a lot of amenities, like a cafe. You have to always go back to that central point where immigration yeah. is, which is really not practical if you're at the very edge of one of these piers. And even the, it was not the case this time, the immigration facilities for me are a bit messy. Basically not to be up to the standards of what Thailand for me is. And, and because I know we have a lot of listeners in Thailand and they just might hate me right now, but the government agrees with me. The Thai government agrees with me. They've said, we that used to be a great airport. It's not anymore. Well, we're going to invest, and they are investing a lot of money to, to make it the hub it's supposed to be and the best in the region. I don't know if the best, if they can even beat uh, Singapore, because that's a hard one to beat, but they say it. So guys, if you, I'm talking to you, um, Paolo, you might disagree with me, but the Thai government agrees with me that it needs a rehaul. So they've, you've seen it probably actually that they have added a new, I mean, you've not been in it, but there's a new, one of these piers that is called S, I think. So they've built yeah, a, an right, entire, yeah, yeah, they've built an entire addition 
to the layout we we knew it i think it opened very recently they they have a third run, runway that is opening um i think in july it's so like in two three months they will be then yet another terminal one of these piers uh similar satellite pier another one and another runway so they'll end up with a, with four runway are they gonna refurbish part of what's existing again with the goal of being back in the they say the top 20 globally i don't know what top 20 and what ranking they're using but they feel that it's been going a bit down and i i i i feel like that so and the other thing and that and then i'll ask you how was your transfer i feel it's confusing so they have so uh i booked so Etihad and 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 Bangkok Airways, I think you also flew Bangkok Airways. Yep. They have a they have a coach here. So when I yep. booked my Etihad flight, I booked with Etihad my uh, Bangkok Airways. So I said at least with that, I have uh, a protected uh, layover in case anything happens. It was only a two hour layover, but and I had never done that transition. So I, like you, I. I love to search. I googled uh, how you know where is Bangkok Airways located in Bangkok. Where does usually uh, Etihad land? And you you can see that by going to flight history as well. And it was the information online wasn't very conclusive, but it, most of them say I think it was transfer four for Bangkok Airways. Not that it tell, told me anything, but that's what I noted. Anyway, I said I'll figure like whatever. I'll figure it out when I land. Yeah, we land. And you have these big, as soon as you exit the, 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 the arrival gate, you have these big boards. And I'm like, okay, so where is the next flight? And the first, huge, there's four screens next to yep. each other. They do not tell you the gate. They tell you the transfer uh, number that you need to reach. And the transfer number, indeed, for Bangkok Airways, it said four. Then you look on, I remember it was on my right, and I see all this sign, the signage. And I'm like, okay, where is four? And there's like... A, peer A, peer B, peer C, peer D. I'm like, I need four. And it, it was not clear. They have this mix and match of numbers and letters. So I advance a little bit and I see, oh, there's another board of four, these uh, big plasma LCD screens, this time with the actual flight numbers. And I'm like, okay, so I'm going to look on this one. What is the flight number? And there it says, your gate of departure will be E, peer A. E, which is where I actually landed. Okay. So transfer four, which for, I never found, but I didn't have to find, it was on the opposite end. But I, what I just had to do is just the first transfer, go back up on the same basically pier where I was, and I was there. So it's it's always been for me confusing in how the signage is done, basically. It's a bit... Uh, and it's it's not that it's a confusing airport because the you know the piers are pretty straight you know there's not like uh, yeah yeah so it's just I think they just have to be the, the signage a bit better but look it's not a big deal it's just that they deserve a bit of a better airport but maybe you love it you told me that you liked it actually so go ahead yeah I, I I mean I I, tra I remember traveling two thousand and three I went through the old Don Wang Airport yeah uh, on my way out to Australia and that was really really run down really run down and it's still there i mean air asia yes and some of the other low-cost guys still still yes. fly in there but uh i've been through there a few times over the last 10 15 years um i agree with you it's looking a little bit dated i think if i was to go into a new industry and a new job i'd become a window cleaner at bangkok <laughs> airport because you'd make a fortune <laughs> cleaning glass the glass was filthy on the outside so yeah. they need to go need to get somebody out with a rope and you know a bucket and a, and a squidgy um, and, and clean the glass um <laughs> so when when we landed uh so we landed but i say we were early come off the runway and then we just stopped on a taxiway oh and uh, we sat there for about five minutes and the captain came on the tunnel and said, oh, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're, uh, we're just waiting for our gate. Uh, someone else is in our gate at the minute. We'll be, uh, be on the way shortly. So we must have been about there about 10 minutes, just sitting on a taxiway. And then we put into the gate. Now, the gates either side of us were completely empty. Hmm. So it's like, why can't we just go to the gate next door? I know there's like an allocation, et cetera, but all the other gates were empty. And, and it's just, oh. Okay. Anyway, we get off. We're in the uh, we're at A gate. So we yes. were then flying uh, Thai Airways again from uh, Bangkok to Hanoi. Yes. Um. So we get off, and it says we are departing from H, which is completely the opposite, the opposite. Other end of the uh, the terminal. Yep. Okay. So we're like, okay, what what do we do? And it's like, well, 
had a quick look at a map and we could see that there were uh, there's Thai Airways lounges at each of the arms that come out of the main terminal. So it's like, right, let's head to H, get to the lounge there, and then we can have a sit down for an hour, have something to drink, and then and we're we depart. So we walk all the way down to H, find a lounge, uh, quite quite a small lounge, uh, but nice. Uh, perfectly mm-hmm. you know lots of facilities etc so we sit there for an hour and then it comes up and says uh, go to gate for our flight to hanoi so yep. we come out of the lounge and um, we are in the gate pretty much bang opposite the the lounge itself so we go go across we walk down the stairs to the actual gate and there's loads of people sitting there and the 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 Thai rep comes up to us and he we didn't show him a boarding card and he went oh no the flight's delayed go back to the lounge oh but we don't know how we knew that we were business class passengers <laughs> unless there was a bit of our boarding card sticking out of our passport in our hand that said Royal Silk or something like that. He said, go upstairs. When it says we are boarding, then come back down. Okay. He said, it's going to be another half an hour, 40 minutes, which I thought was great, actually. I, yeah, I thought that was a is. really good thing. So we went back upstairs, started boarding, back down, and we're on a we're on a bus. It's not a, an yeah. average. That's yeah. not great. So, uh-huh. Anyway, so we we get on the get on the bus, um, and the bus takes us all the way back to a gate. <laughs> uh-huh. And oh, and God. I was like, I, I knew we were flying an A three twenty from uh, from Bangkok to to Hanoi. So I'm looking out the window, looking for A three twenty. Couldn't see an A three twenty anywhere. So where the hell are we going? And we go all the way back to a gate. We were at a gate next to where we just got off the plane an hour or so before. Yeah, that that these things happen. I, yeah. I get it's not the most efficient way. Yeah, yeah. These so anyway, happen. we get we get on uh, business class on the three twenty is only three rows, and it's it's like most uh, short haul business class now. It's you've got the three seats, but the one in the middle is blocked out. It's like Europe. Yeah, just just European okay. business. Yeah. Okay. okay. So anyway, the uh, the cabin crew really attentive. Uh, we sit down and everyone else is then getting on the aircraft but they're trying to sort of squeeze past all the people getting on with our glass of champagne and take our meal order now we've got an hour and a half flight to hanoi we've got a three course meal nice nice so it's like okay so anyway it takes the order and uh, so i had lamb chops and now this could have gone one or two ways. It could have been that they were like leather and just been as though you put a, a lamb chop in a microwave or been really, really good, right? So I'm a bit kind of, okay, let's give it a go. But I've eaten so much over the last 12, 14 hours. Yes. That I don't actually really need to eat. So if they're no good, I'm not I'm not going to starve to death. Um, so oh, these, they were really nice. Ah, nice. Again, really, really good. Uh, no in-flight entertainment at all. Uh, mm-hmm. on this particular flight so just again watch them off my ipad but uh really quick flight straight into uh straight into hanoi and uh yeah it was that was that was a, a you know a, a good experience there wasn't anything that apart from the fact that you got a nice meal on a china plate and proper knives and forks on a on a short haul flight which you don't get in europe anymore yeah that that was that was it there, there were no other highlights the, the aircraft itself used to be uh thai smile they used to be called which yeah, I, yeah. I remember from a few years ago, but they've got rid of the smile bit now and it's just tie. Oh, okay. I didn't realize that. Uh, yeah. Huh. Did I not see? No. Uh, I tried to remember which other place because yeah, I was doing plane spotting. What was it? Did I see a tie? Yeah, I didn't pay attention. First of, uh, first of all, foremost, because I was not flying tie. This is where a story diverged. So we'll get to you now for a bit yeah. and then we'll rejoin where. So I'm going to describe my flight to Cambodia a bit later. The only thing I'll say about Bangkok, I went to the Oman Air Lounge, which is probably the second best. The best is EVA. I mean, it's a nightclub. Is it the best? It's a nightclub. It's, guys, if you ever go to the EVA Air Lounge, it's a nightclub. It's like, you know, the walls are black, there's mirrors, and there's like a light show. I'm really not kidding. Uh, but uh, I didn't have access to that. Uh, the Oman Air is probably, it's not a fantastic lounge, but it has shower facilities, whatever. It was nice. So I want to... I want to hear about, so this is where our stories diverge, guys, as you understood, because I was only in Southeast Asia for, what, 10 days? And you were for nearly three weeks. Because only you, three weeks, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Because you've so. done Vietnam uh, uh, before going to Cambodia, which is why we didn't see each other, because by the yeah. time you had arrived in Cambodia, we were basically leaving. Um, and uh, so you you said you arrived in Hanoi, so it's a yeah. no-buy no buy airport, if I remember correctly. I think I described it, by the way, guys, if you're interested in episode 101, I think that's probably, it is in, in 2019 because I flew there in 
August of 2019, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Mia had arrived in the domestic bit because I'd flown from Ho Chi Minh, Saigon uh, with Vietnam Airlines. So I remember it that that it was a, you know it was a good airport. You find I also used it to go with a seaplane to um, Halong Bay. Uh, so it was also through the domestic terminal, which was very nice. Uh, I remember Captain Bruce, a Canadian who, uh, who was uh, flying that uh, seaplane. Maybe now he, is, uh, he works at the Dubai airport. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's a condolier. <laughs> and, Just uh, one corner. <laughs> Obviously, I should have said Paolo has Italian origins, which is why his name is said Paolo, not Paul, like me, even though mine should be Pavlos, but my parents decided to call me Paul. Uh, the um, Yeah, and I departed as well from Hanoi Airport with, I think it was, yeah, it was Emirates. So that was on a new, newer terminal that was opened in 2015, the international one, which I guess is where you landed as an international yeah. flight. So did you like that airport? Uh, so yeah. we, we landed, a uh, very quick exit. Um, you, literally, the air bridge takes you straight up into um, immigration. Yeah, uh, immigration was was pretty slick. There were, there were a lot of uh, immigration officers there. Literally, take one look at you, stamp your passport, and through. No, Good. no emotion, no conversation. Yeah, they're very stern. It's very stern. Just yes. straight out. Yeah, I'll tell the story when we reach. Uh... What she mean? Because that's where I arrived, and I never described my experience. Said what she mean? But yeah, they're very stern. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so straight out, uh, luggage came along pretty quickly, and then and then we exited the airport. So actually, I didn't see very much of, yeah. of the international terminal. Um, so we were in Hanoi for two or three days, um, and then uh, we then headed south. So we went back to back to Hanoi Airport. Uh, we went into domestics this time, yep. um, and then we flew to Da Nang. Oh, nice! Uh, I've never seen in a, that in, in middle of uh, in middle of Vietnam. Which airline did you fly with? Vietnam Airlines. How was that? Yeah. Which was it? A three hundred and twenty or was it was a three hundred and twenty-one? Yeah. 320. So the again uh, check-in was was pretty uh, pretty quick. Uh, security really quick. Um, went went in. Uh, I was trying to think where we ate. We ate in a, in the airport, and I can't remember what we did. Maybe it was McDonald's. Oh no, it was Burger King. That was right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. We yeah. We went upstairs. And it's like you know we've been in Asia for a few days, eating lots of great Asian food, but we just need a break from Asian food. So we see see a Burger King. Great. Let's just go and have a burger and chips. Man, the greasiest burger I've ever eaten in my life. You know, it, you literally your hands were dripping in fat. It was just like that. Uh, so anyway, back down. Um, go to go to the gate. Um, a bus, bus to uh, the aircraft, get on the aircraft, and they were boarding from the front and the back. So we were row, I think, row 13, row 14, mm -hmm. and they said board from the back of a 321. What? That makes no yeah, sense. board from the back. So I'll go on a plane, and it just turns into carnage. There's people getting on the front that need to get to the back, there's people at the back that need to get to the and it, it's all that jostling down the aisle, and there's not much room, and everyone's trying to get a bag in the overhead compartment. It was it was very disorganized. Okay. Um and, and I've not flown Vietnam Airlines any before, so it was like, oh, okay, this is this is this is not brilliant. Um, and the seats, the, the the covering, the the moquette on the on the yeah. uh, upholstery, it looked like something out of a seventies furniture store, something your <laughs> granny used to have. And it's like, and, and 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 you and I had spoken again before we travelled, and I said we were travelling Vietnam Airlines. You went, oh yeah, they're really really good, and I'm thinking. Oh, Am I missing something here? It's like <laughs> this is, this is just this is this is not what I was expecting. Oh yeah. Anyway, yeah, took well. our seats on time departure. Flight was fine. Literally a bottle of water. That was it. It's a very um, short flight though, right? Yeah, hour and hour and ten minutes. It's yeah. three hundred miles. Yeah. Um. So get to Da Nang again really quick. So it's a domestic flight. Literally walk into the terminal. I think we were the only aircraft at the air, uh, the terminal. Pick our bags up straight out. Um, so we had a few days in Hoi An. Uh, nice. We then drove up to Hue. Uh, mm -hmm. and had a couple of days in Hue looking at the Sistel. So for those that don't know, Hue used to be the uh, the capital of Vietnam yep. hundreds and hundreds of years ago. So I had a, a few days in Hue, which is great. And then we went to the new Hue Airport, which um, is, is 20 minutes drive out of the city. Okay. Um, we get there, and it was like a morgue. There were there wasn't an aircraft on the ground. 
Oh. Um, so we check in straight away again, really, really quick. Um, and there was us and a Viet jet flight, both to Ho Chi Minh at roughly the same time. But that was it. And then I think the next flight was about five hours later. Wow. So really, really quick. But the airport really. is is like, is it oversized for that type of traffic? <laughs> yeah. Or? So it's it's clearly been, I think it's been over a couple of years. It's okay. clearly been built for the future. Yeah. Um, like a lot of things in that region. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it had eight gates. Um, six of which are for domestic, two for international. But I don't think there's actually any international flights from there at the moment. And they're yeah. all domestic flights. Mm -hmm. um, but lots of, uh, quite a few shops for the size of the airport, a nice, uh, good few restaurants, et cetera. So, you know, all the staff there look really bored because <laughs> they, they just haven't got the volume of passengers, but yeah, they're being yeah. staffed up, yeah, ready yeah. ready for the explosion of tourism as, as and when it hits that, that region. Yeah. Um, flight was on time. We had a... I believe he was Italian, the pilot uh, oh, for Vietnam nice. Airlines. But this time, get on, much more modern upholstery. Um, yeah, looked, uh -huh. you know, looked to the point and it's like, oh, okay, actually, this is not too bad. So, again, quick flight down to Ho Chi Minh, another hour. Uh, pretty hard landing in Ho Chi Minh, it has to be say, uh, said. It, uh, he hit the tarmac with a bump. Um, <laughs> but, the, but the one thing about Ho Chi Minh Airport is... Hanoi Airport is quite a way out of Hanoi. Ho yes. Chi Minh is really close. To yeah, the is it in the city? You feel like you're directly into traffic as soon as you get out. Like, oh, yeah, it's. <laughs> I mean, we were flying in, and I I never flew to the old Kai Tak Airport in Hong Kong. Yeah, but it felt a bit like that. You were sort of uh, dodging the washing lines across the apartments, <laughs> etc. And and you're in. I was like, wow, okay. And again, come off the runway, and we had to queue up a little while for a gate. Um, and then, then we <laughs> got to the gate, got off, and wow, chaos! Yeah, absolute chaos. So there's four baggage carousels for domestics in Ho Chi Minh. Each of them had four flights worth of luggage on at the same time, <laughs> and it, and but they're all really close to one another. So you literally come in off the aircraft, you're in there. And you've got nowhere to go and everyone is jostling for their suitcase. And it's just, it, it was chaos. And it's like, oh my God, man, this is, this is crazy. Um, and so we passed out of, uh, out of, uh, out of the exit into, uh, into the arrivals hall. And yeah, we're just millions of people there. Absolutely yeah. millions of people. Because the, the one thing that I hadn't appreciated before arriving in Vietnam is how many domestic flights they have. Yeah, it's, it's a huge, are, huge it's market. It's a huge market. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know that the route from Ho Chi Minh to Saigon to uh, Hanoi is one of the busiest, in, is, is the busiest in Southeast Asia, I'm pretty yep. sure, and one of the busiest in the world, actually. Well, Viet, uh, I looked at the board and Vietnam Airlines fly every 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm not surprised. That's the one I did. I did a Hano um, sorry, a Ho Chi Minh to to Hanoi with Vietnam Airlines. It was a three fifty man. I was I was totally probably that's why it was very new. So that's why the upholstery was the moquette as you called it was probably not uh, too old. But yeah, that compared to Hanoi, I think the airport is also way older. The one at at uh, Ho Chi Minh, but mm -hmm. compared to Hanoi, the Hanoi is it was fast, efficient. It worked. Hanoi was on both occasions when I landed with, I had arrived from KL uh, with Emirates, I think. Yeah, with Emirates. And uh, I flew then. Uh, so one I arrived, it was uh, international. That's what I'm trying to say. And then I left on the domestic. Both occasions were a, was a bit of a mess. I like chaos, but comparative to what you see in Hanoi, you're like, it's not the same country. Then again, a lot of the people in the South tell you that the North is not the same country <laughs> when you ask them. But, but also, <laughs> they are the same Saigon country. Is, yeah, Saigon, there's a far greater population as well. So yeah, it's, the uh, population of Hanoi is 9 million. The population of Ho Chi Minh is 15. Feels like more chaotic. Yeah. Whereas Hanoi feels way more. I mean, not that uh, not that Hanoi is... Uh, there's chaos here. I know you've experienced it trying to cross the road as well, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it, it, I know it felt more contained compared to, uh, yeah. to what you mean. And, and guys, before I'm getting some, the, the, the reason we use Saigon, not only because the airport is SGN, so it still uses the Saigon name, but also simply because locals call it Saigon, even if the official name has transitioned to Ho Chi Minh city, Ho Chi Minh Ville, uh, locals use Saigon. So it's really not us Europeans uh, that we are using this name out of spite or anything. Um, 
Yeah, that uh, that airport is. I mean, I love chaos, but I, I didn't experience your uh, luggage belt thing. But I've experienced some chaos. I remember the on the way. Did you did you leave from Ho Chi Minh then, or did you? Yep. So we left from Ho Chi Minh and then we went to Cambodia. Meaning it was an international international flight. Yeah, because out, yeah. when I flown the when I left to Hanoi from Ho Chi Minh with that Vietnam Air uh, Vietnam Airlines uh, three fifty nine hundred, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure. Guys, if you remember, that's the one I said on the menu on Vietnam Airlines <laughs> because I was in business class. The menu was saying um, meat. So I had a choice of meat or pasta, and I was like, meat. And I tried to ask the, <laughs> the flight attendant, meat? Which meat? No, no, meat. Okay, so dealer's choice, as Alex said back in the day. Uh, there was this lounge at um, Ho Chi Minh, uh, at the Saigon Airport, which is called the Saigonais, which is French, obviously, because that whole region was under French influence and, and, and colonization. It felt very from the 70s, both the lounge and uh, the domestic terminal. There was even, I remember... When I was checking in, uh, no, so when I was boarding, uh, there was, a, you know, old signs and one sign says, please do not put VHS tapes in your luggage. Who uses VHS tapes anymore this day and age? But So it was really fun how some of these things had stayed, which I think also indicates that at some point they're going to redo a full new airport and they don't bother, you know, rejuvenating that 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 one, I, I think. There's a new terminal that should be opening. Maybe it's a new airport, maybe a new terminal, something like that. Anyway, it was... There, a- there, yeah, there was certainly no evidence of, of, of anything new being built. And in fact, the site is so small, I don't know where they would put something new. Yeah, the site, yeah, you're right. It's landlocked. I mean, it's locked by the city itself. Yeah, around. Yeah. It's surrounded by... As, this what The impression I had as soon as I stepped out of the uh, the airport was... Traffic was already like the chaos of traffic was right in front of it. Yeah, yeah. It's not like a long way, then you slowly enter the city. I must say, because you were smarter than me, you are, as I said earlier, <laughs> when I entered, because I entered Vietnam through that airport, whereas you entered in Hanoi, you had made the e visa, obviously, the electronic visa. I, had no, I didn't, need, didn't need, a, need a visa for Vietnam. Oh, as a, oh, I didn't share. So I've, you know, my experience dates from 2019. So I don't know what the current state is. Let's yeah, be like, no visas anyway. in 2019. <laughs> so there was an option between e visa and a visa on arrival. And I had, because I was going for business for work, I had a letter of invitation by the government actually. So I said, okay, so I, I read online that if you have a letter of invitation, you can get easily the visa, visa on arrival. I said, why not? I didn't, I didn't think this through though. That's, that's, that's my, my bad because I landed at, at very late actually. I think the plane, must have landed uh, like at 9th, very late, 9th, 9.30, let's say. The deplaning, super fast. I was in immigration very, very quickly. And I see this little bit which says visa on arrival, a specific, you know, they're like booth and people. And I'm going there and I must have spent, I'm not kidding, 50 minutes to get the visa because you have to go, you wait, then you submit your passport, then you fill out a form, then you wait, then you come back, you stamp, you sign, you wait, they, they put something in your passport. 50 minutes. By the time I had reached those famous l- l- luggage belts that you mentioned, my luggage must have been going round and round and round and round for actually half an hour. <laughs> so don't do that. If there is still, unvi- for, if your passport requires a visa, do the e-visa. And they were very, hence my experience, very stern. I was trying, you know, I was like, I'm a, I was fine. I was not pissed off to have to wait. I was pissed off on myself. But I'm like, you know, what it, it, it is what it is. But I was trying to be nice with them, and they were super stern, like no, no smile. I'm like, oh, fine, you know, it's, I'm, okay. Yeah, it's not the only country like that, you know. There's other countries where the immigration officials, like uh, United States, are not the nicest either. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, you and I couldn't be an immigration officer. We're no. too nice. Yeah, we failed a personality test. We have a personality. <laughs> so, you went then to Cambodia. I'm going to join you to Cambodia yeah. soon, but. Because you were in an airport that I haven't done, so you went to the south of Cambodia. Yeah. You went to uh, Chinookville. Yeah. So we flew from Ho Chi Minh to Chinookville with Cambodian Angor Air. Which I've also experienced, but I'll talk about it yep. later. So go ahead, tell us yeah, about so, that. Uh, so when we when we were planning our trip, it's like, okay, we, we need to get from Ho Chi Minh to Chinookville. Uh, we could go by bus. And I was like, mm, I could go by bus. It's going to be eight, nine hours. And, and I've actually done uh, back in 2006. So I actually did the bus journey. 
Yeah. Um, and at that time it was, it was uncomfortable. Uh, so it's like, right, we can, we can fly. We can, we can do a direct flight. And uh, so I booked it uh, with what I thought was going to be Vietnam Airlines. Oh. So when I, when I did the research, it took me to the Vietnam Airlines uh, website, booked it. So, okay, great. So paid, paid for the flight and then got the confirmation through that it's a code share with Cambodian Angle Air. I've never heard of this airline before. So it's like, okay, let's... So hold uh, on, hold on. So you booked via the Thai... No, Vietnam Airlines website. Yeah, Vietnam Airlines. So yeah. your entire interaction was via that, the website of Vietnam Airlines. Yep. Oh, yep, wow. Okay. Absolutely. Interesting. So, uh, so booked it and then get the confirmation through, says you are traveling with Cambodian or flight operated by Cambodian Angle Air. Okay. So it's like, okay, not, not heard of them. Let's do a bit of research. TripAdvisor, Google Reviews, everything else, one-star airline. <laughs> You know, the headlines were, do not fly with this outfit. And I'm like, oh, no, what have I done? And But this is the only option. This is the only way of flying between the two. Then we wanted to fly from Sien Nukville to Siem Reap. Yes. Only airline, Cambodian Angle Air. Yes. I had the same experience. And I was like, okay. And and this was not via the Vietnam Airlines website this time. So, like, oh, Jesus, what do, we, what do we do? And then I'm looking at other options. Uh, can we, again, can we take a bus? Come on, forget it. Can't take a bus. It's, it's 12, 14 hours. It's, yeah, forget uh, it. I'm not, yeah, I'm not yeah. sitting on a coach for no, no, 14 no, 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 hours. No, no. So, anyway, took a pump, paid for the tickets. Anyway, literally, while we were traveling around Vietnam, I was on flight radar every day looking at these two flights. So from uh, Ho Chi Minh to Sien Nukville, Sien Nukville to Siem Reap. And every and because everyone said, oh, they regularly cancel the flight. Uh, they don't look after you. You can be sitting in the airport for days. They don't talk to you. They don't look after you. Oh, Jesus, man. I had this. And if these flights don't go, this really screws up our entire right. Yeah, because you have like these kind of short, like three days, then three yeah, days. three days flight, and then you move days, on. Flight. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I, okay. So anyway. I kept looking and the flights were on time or they were even departing like 20 minutes earlier than planned. So I'm like, okay, I've got a bit of assurance here that looks like this, these flights are going to go. The airline's not going to go bust before we go on them or et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, <laughs> when we, uh, when we left Ho Chi Minh, uh, we had a really early morning flight. So I think it was about half past seven quarter to eight. So got, got taken to the airport, got dropped off. Um, and walk into the terminal and it says go to zone D for check-in. So we get to, to zone D and most of zone D was China Southern. And so there was a, clearly a flight going to, I think, Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, there's three, three check-in desks that are not open, no signs of any people there, nothing on the screen saying this is going to be at Cambodian Angle Air. So, But there's a few people mingling around. So we all start talking to one another. Are you flying Cambodian Angle Air? Yep, yep, we're flying. It gets to an hour and a half and uh, before the flight, and there were actually three Cambodian Angkor Air flights at the same time: Shinnukville, Siem Reap, and Phnom Penh, all okay. going pretty much at the same time. Mm -hmm. Hour and a half before the flight, all the check-in desks open. Well, when I say all, the three of them. Yeah. So we check in fairly quick and straightforward, no major issues. Then we get to um, security and immigration to get out of Vietnam. That was lengthy. That was that was, that was long. Um, so anyway, get through, have time to pick up a coffee, and then the Cambodian, all the Cambodian Angkor Air uh, departures were from sort of three gates, one next to one another. So we walk down to the gate. Uh, we can see we can see the aircraft. They're all ATR seventy two turboprops. Yeah. So it's, it is what it is. Anyway, we then get called about half an hour before flight departure to to go through and board the aircraft, all 15 passengers. That was it. It was, the flight was deserted. Um, so everybody spread out. Everyone got a, a row each, um, took off. And it was, it was, it was fine. Um, yeah. early, you know, pretty much early-ish departure. Um, they bought round a cup of water each. Uh, not a bottle, a cup, and the water was warm. I, not, uh, I will talk about my own experience. It's exactly the same for that. Yet, yeah, it's like I'm not drinking this. I don't know where this has come from. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so anyway, we uh, we land in uh, Shenukville and um, pull up to and but the runway at Shenukville uh, is really really long. 
but there's okay. only one runway. So you land, and obviously a turboprop doesn't take much to stop. Yeah. But it's one of those places where you have to then go all the way down to the other end of the runway to the very end and then do a Yui and come back on yourself. <laughs> it felt like we were going to drive to see a Nookville. It, it <laughs> went on and on and on and on. Anyway, get to eventually get to the gate, pull up. We are the only flight there. <laughs> so we get off the plane, all 15 passengers walk into the immigration hall. And again, a bit like you explained with Vietnam, uh, you could either do an e-visa or visa on arrival. So we did an e-visa. Uh, so we walked in. There were more immigration officers there than passengers. And, and they were literally sort of fighting to get a passenger because there were more of them than passengers. So I don't know if this is a case of if you don't get a passenger, you don't get paid for the day. I'm, I'm not quite sure how it all works. But, you know, so anyway, we, we were straight there. And I think we were the only two passengers with um, e-visas. Everyone else oh, did nice. visa on arrival. So get there, show them the visa, show them the paperwork. They take your fingerprints, a bit like the mm -hmm. US, you know, thumbprint and all your fingerprints, and then straight out and straight to see Nookville very, very, very quick and easy. Uh, so we had, um, we then took a boat out to Koh Rong, which is a little island off the coast of uh, Cambodia. Uh, I have to say, for those of you that are listening, if you want a get away from it all kind of place to go on holiday for a few days with a fantastic beach and turquoise seas and warm water, etc. Korong is the place to go. It's not really known that well, but it was paradise. Nice. Absolutely paradise. Uh, so we had five days there, uh, very different to the streets of Vietnam, very quiet, uh, nice and chilled out, let the blood pressure go back down, not have to worry about crossing the road, that kind of thing. Um, and then back to see a Nookville and then back on a flight to uh, Siem Reap. So back to Siem Nookville Airport. Uh, we get to the airport and we are the last flight of the day to depart. Uh, this is now 11 o'clock in the morning. So there are two flights a day, one from Ho Chi Minh and one from Siem Reap. So we check in, there's no one at the check-in desks, straight in, six check-in desks open for a turboprop flight. So literally straight in, is the airport is the airport uh, new or old? Do you, do you it's a um, deal for it. So the airfield is owned by the Cambodian uh, Air Force. Oh wow! Okay. Um, the terminal building uh, looks relatively new, but it's very small. There's okay. literally one coffee shop land side, one coffee shop air side, and the smallest little duty free shop you've ever okay. seen. Okay. So anyway, check in. We go to uh, go to security. And the security staff, I turned into an international celebrity. So the, the, these, <laughs> these four Cambodian ladies doing the, the, the bag searches and, you know, the frisking down, etc. Well, I don't think any of them literally were taller than my waist. And of course, so they look at me and it's like, oh my God, the Jolly Green Giants turned up. And... They they were just laughing at one another, and I was just the butt of their jokes. And obviously, they were conversing in in uh, Khmer, uh, not in English. But you could tell by their humour, they were just taking the Mickey out of me. And then they were putting boxes on the floor to stand on no to way. see if they could get to my my height. <laughs> it was it was hilarious, and and they were taking photos. I wanted to take a photo, but then I thought, well, if I take a photo, will they get in trouble? But it was it was hilarious. They they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. That's and uh, then walked into the uh, departure lounge and and sat there, got a, a can of coke, and waited for a flight. And then plane came in uh, from CM Reap. Literally, was on the ground twenty five minutes, boarded and back out to CM Reap. Yeah, again got a. Uh, offered a cup of warm yellow water. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we, flight flight there was was absolutely fine, um, and then we landed in the new CM Reap Airport, which you you'd already been through and said uh, it's uh, it's brand new. Um, well, so, yeah, we literally it opened six months ago, so it's yeah. literally brand 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 new. I'm going to stop you there because we're going to rejoin. In, in, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I'm. I'm myself. I'm still in Bangkok, even though chronologically, it's timelines don't make sense because you've already, I've already been to Siem Reap by the time you arrive. But it is, anyway, so I'm in Bangkok. I'm flying with Bangkok Airways, which I'd never. Fl I know you're gonna talk about it later because mm -hmm. it's how you flew from Siem Reap to back to Bangkok. Bangkok. So, yeah. uh, as I said, the, the the gate when we arrived from with Etihad was literally two gates off from the gate that uh, Bangkok Airways was leaving from. So Oman Air, we stayed there, whatever. It was really, it was a nice layover, uh, not too long, two two hours or something. And then we arrive, I'm always the guy who, you know, 
when I look at the departure, I don't look at departure board, boards as in, a, of course I do if there's like delayed or cancellation or for something, but mm-hmm. I will never wait for the go to gate or boarding. I usually say 45 minutes before the f- departing time is when I'm in front of the gate because I know that I'll be pretty much in the front of the queue because 45 minutes is a bit before they start announcing that you need to go to the gate but not too late that I'm in the back of the queue. I arrived there and that was a mistake because actually <laughs> they padded the time so much between, because it's not a long flight, right? Uh, no. they, they only need 45 minutes and they padded like an hour and 20, which means that by the time I arrived, I actually waited forever in front of that gate at Bangkok Airways because, uh, in front of, sorry, the uh, Bangkok Airport, because obviously they are padded the time. Fine, it's okay, you know, I, I wait, so we're... So I'm in economy, right? But I'm in zone one. Why am I in zone one? I mean, I'm not even, I'm not in the front or anything. But then they started, uh, let's board zone two. And I look at the guy like, why not zone one? And actually they board the back first and then the board the front after, which is actually pretty, pretty smart. I don't think there is even a business class or whatever. Not that I would have taken any business class or anything, but uh, I don't think there is. And look, it was... Uh, 319, uh, it was from 2005, because obviously I, I check these things when I'm on, on plane finder or, or, or flight radar. The boarding was efficient. There was, surprisingly, because when we come from Europe, very few people with very large carry-on, so it was very orderly. And the flight is, as I said, 50 minutes. I said 45, maybe 50 minutes. There's a meal service. What? I mean, you've experienced that as well, but there's a meal service. I was not expecting, I didn't read upon, uh, it was with the only option to go anyway there. And I was like, is this a meal service? It was a northern northern style curried noodle, I think. Very good. That was, that was not only there's a meal service, but it was actually very good. And it's a pure economy, no premium eco, no special deal attached to my nothing, right? So I was, hmm. Uh, it was actually funny that the, the, there was this, person next to me, she had ordered a special meal kosher and uh, and said to the flight attendant that, yeah, I ordered kosher and I don't eat meat. And they say, yeah. And so she asked, is it meat? He said, no, no, it's, it's, it's going to be fish. Okay. That's the early part of the, of the interaction. They come later with herd tray first, you know, because special meals are usually delivered first. And uh, she opens it, and um, it is steamed vegetable with what clearly looks like chicken. And she asks, <laughs> right at the end, she, she asks the flight attendant, uh, I thought it was fish, and, uh, and the flight attendant uh, answers, that was today's choice. Chicken is today's choice. It was a very weird interaction anyway, uh, so she ate only the vegetables. I had like these, um, as I said, uh, noodles or something. It was really good. Uh, legroom was surprisingly good uh when you especially when we used to it in Europe and reducing more and more the legroom and economy the, the the legroom was 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 good I was not you know we're both tall I was in row six or seven it was really nice normal economy nothing special right uh this is a three three like a new usual three uh, three nineteen uh so really 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 nice the the, the plane landed early Phnom Penh. uh the first sight you see on the runway at Phnom Penh, there's this aircraft, a big one, a big bird. I couldn't, it was dark, so I couldn't recognize because we landed at night. It was difficult to, like at 11 p.m. past what it was, but it was an aircraft without a tail. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> this sounds ominous. Uh, look, the airport is lovely, Phnom Penh. Uh, it feels like it's been refurbished. So it's not new, but it's been refurbished because I was hesitating. Is it a new airport? No, it's an old airport. I didn't read, it, re- read about it before arriving. When you realize it's a bit of an old airport, is as soon as you sit to get, there's like a narrow set of stairs that go downstairs. And when I say narrow, it's super narrow, which means that if you have an entire, it's only a 319, but there's still like a lot of people coming. It's a bit of a, and people want to go fast because they want to reach the, the visa thing, uh, the immigration procedures fast. I was one of the first ones because I have very long legs like you are, like you, Paolo. <laughs> And in front of us, there's like these huge amounts of visa on arrival booth with exactly your description. An amount of immigration officers I had never seen, but because I had visa on arrival, I learned from a Vietnamese, even though this is Cambodia, uh, I went straight to one of the booth, uh, the normal booth, and there was three, I think, that said e-visa. Uh, the guy, it took a little bit of 
kerfuffle because you know the guy looks at a computer, compares the data, or whatever, and then they the visa is weird. Is it, they, did they do that with you? It's, they staple the visa into your yeah. passport. <laughs> yeah. It's like, are you destroying my passport anyway? So it was, no, it was it was it was it was fine. And and again, I could see this kind of the airport seemed parts of them seemed clearly a bit old, but it had been refurbished. And because I was curious, I looked at it. I say, how old is that airport? And actually, the airport is old, but they had an agreement with a French, um, I think it was a holding company. They did a holding company. Uh, they did a, a refurb, I would say, now I don't have the notes in front of me, but I would say in the early 2000s. So it, it is pretty new. But, and that's interesting, that these, these French, because they'll come to CM Rep that we'll talk about. The This French consortium had signed, I think, for, I don't remember, like a concession for, let's say, 20 years or 25 years. And suddenly they lost it. The government said, bye-bye. Now it's going to be the China Development Bank. And what they're doing, the China Development Bank, along with its consortium as well, they are building two airports, one of which we'll describe soon because it's CMREP, the new one that we've been at. And they are building a new airport at Phnom Penh. So similar story that what you said about Ho Chi Minh. Currently, the Phnom Penh airport is very practical because it's in the city. I mean, kind of in the city. It's very close to the center, like um, 20 minutes probably. The new one is going to be like far, 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 far out in the south. But, and that's where you're going back to our comment about building for the future. <laughs> they, they're building the ninth largest airport in the world in Phnom Penh. So, guys, for context, Cambodia is not such a populous country compared to Vietnam. Vietnam is what, 90, 100 million people? Uh, and Cambodia is 15. So, exactly. So, they're building this massive ninth biggest airport i think it's literally almost 3000 hectares uh it's going to be bigger than bangkok airport i'm not kidding four runways the first phase is opening next year with 13 million passenger capacity with one runway and the current the current airport the one i've been in is 5 million huh? so 13 million and the road to it is complete as well or at least in completion now at the time of this podcast. The phase two, which is already started, is going to lead to 30 million passengers. And the phase three, which is already started already, is going to lead to an airport of 50 million passenger capacity. And you're like, huh? So on one end, you're like, it's I, I admire this type of construction because I love this kind of big infrastructure as a plan. And the other hand, coming back to the very top of our podcast, I'm like, what is London Heathrow doing? I mean, we're not building anything when you see up <laughs> Uh, anyway, back to the current Phnom Penh, because then we'll talk a little bit about uh, SIA, because that's, that comes into the story. This is why I wanted to mention uh, that. Uh, everything was very fast, as I said. So I went out and very quickly to the city, Plantation Hotel, Great Pool, uh, fantastic time. It's not a touristy city. Most people avoid it. Uh, even locals, Cambodians say, well, basically, they say, what are you doing there? It's dangerous. Uh, I would not say it's dangerous. You have to be a big, I guess, more careful than in other cities have been in Southeast Asia, but not to the point of like being as, I never felt any danger or anything. It's a mess in terms of like walking. I love walking, but like walking there, like, uh, you know, sidewalks, they, they don't know about them. Uh, so, but yeah, and, and uh, one recommendation, Khmer Woman Food. It's a hole in the world restaurant I found totally by accident. One of the best food I had. It was fantastic Khmer food, uh, highly run by three women, uh, including uh, guys, I'm going to preempt what I'm, the name of the food. Guys, uh, don't be perverts, I including a, a name of the food that was glorious. It was called Morning Glory. And that was absolutely delicious uh, in that Khmer woman food. So if you happen to be in Phnom Penh, you should go there. Almost no tourists the whole time uh, for the two, three days we were there. Really nice. Uh, only one dude got on my nerve. It was a random foreign foreigner. He was an influencer, you know, walking with a stick, with a GoPro or a like, and shouting at a GoPro all around. And for some reason, the day I was visiting the palace, the royal palace, this guy was always close to where I was. He was the most bothersome. I said earlier about the biggest... Uh, close your close your ears, kids. Asshole. He was so. I, I did something, and I'm you know I'm a kid as well sometimes. So I'm maybe he's listening to this show. He's gonna hate me now. I tried to spoil his shots. So every time he was filming, <laughs> you can see me 
with my middle finger, try to kind of scratch my head. And like, I'm spoiling all these shots. I'm like, this guy. And you could see the locals. Uh, there was a lot of local tourism. And the also the monks were, you know, the famously draped in orange. They were all looking at him like, what the hell is this guy? You know, he was shouting and doing like stupid video influencer anyway. So yeah, that's the, the only bad thing. Otherwise, is I, I liked going there. And then I went to Siem Rep. So I so remember I took, it took me 20 minutes to go from the airport to next to the Mekong, so next to the, the river. So very close to the city. That was at night at like 11.30. So I asked them, the hotel, I said, should I go early? You know, is there a lot of traffic in the morning? There was an early morning flight. Is there traffic in the morning? And how long do they ask for me to be ahead of time at the airport? And they said, oh, lots of traffic, lots of traffic. And uh, you need to be there three hours ahead. I'm like, okay, well, really? What? So I'm like, for a domestic all, flight? <laughs> yeah, so first of all, like, oh, no. no. <laughs> I didn't do that, but then they still instilled that thing in my head, like, I mean, I don't want to miss that flight. So I'm like, okay, let's go. Anyway, you know, it's, it's not going to change anything if we leave at 6 in the morning, 5.30, 6 or 6.30. So let's go early. And indeed, yeah, the traffic, they've probably never been to Jakarta because there was some traffic. I'm not going to say there was no traffic, but there, I mean, I, it took me 40 minutes to get there. And domestic only opens 90 minutes. It was two hour, more than two hours in advance. I couldn't, So I couldn't even check in. So there was a check-in desks were closed at that point for that flight. So I spent my time in a overpriced coffee yeah. at some some place called the Blue Pumpkin or something, which allowed me to check at the airport and again see that part of it was refurbished. It's, it's a it's nice an okay airport actually. Um, there was a few international flights like you, Guangzhou, a lot of uh, Macau, Jiayong, of course Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok. So very when I say international, all the region because that's something we didn't say. I don't know if you tried. There's no way of going direct from Europe to Phnom Penh. No. You can't, right? There's no way, right? There's a, I, we should have said that at the start. It's not that we wanted to go to Bangkok or I tried Hong Kong. Or, it's just there's no, they're probably going for it when they're going to open this new airport. Uh, but there's, currently, there's no way. So all international is pretty much uh, Southeast Asia. But who's going to fly there from the UK if they do do that? Well, BA won't. I mean, BA is still missing. BA from, doesn't even fly to Bangkok. Doesn't go to Bangkok or... Or which, Kuala Lumpur. Which makes no sense to me. No. Because I checked BA. I said, why not check BA? Obviously, it's our national carrier. They do not fly to Bangkok. They used to, however. I think pretty yeah, yeah, they used, used to. to. Yeah, yeah. I, I've flown a couple of times. But uh, they're going to start again in September from Gatwick. Oh, at least. Yeah, because, I mean, Thailand is pretty popular for, yeah, the, yeah. for the UK market. So I was very surprised to see that they're not flying there. Okay, so I didn't know that. Thank you. So so maybe Cambodian Angle Air are going to buy some A380s from Thai. <laughs> Oh, we start nice. flying to Phnom Penh. There you go. <laughs> that would be nice. Um, or Global Airlines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Don't talk about those guys. I don't know where, where they are. I haven't followed, but they bought, they are buying a second 380, I think. I'm They've not got sure. got three. Three? They already have three. But are they flying? Or are they just like they are? Uh, no, they're, they're still tucked away somewhere. There's um, at Abu Dhabi, guys, we're jumping back and forth. Sorry for that. But uh, at Abu Dhabi on the ground, there are, there were three. Qantas say 380. I was like, they're still there. So they haven't, I think they've put back some or maybe none of them actually, but there were three and they are still in storage. I mean, in the middle of, a, um, of one of part of, you know, a remote part of the airport. When you were taxiing, you can see, I was like, what is a 380 over there? So yeah, maybe uh, Cambodian Angkor, yeah, they could also buy the. <laughs> so, so uh, a warm cup of water. Can you imagine oh, yeah. that for a 14 hour? For 14 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so the security at uh, Phnom Penh for the domestic was tiny, but it was fast. And they didn't really care what it is in your bag. As in, you're like, uh, should I put, uh, I didn't have a laptop or anything, but I had a Kindle, uh, which is always, you know, Kindle is, some airports say it's like a laptop. Some airports don't care. I should have said from the start, I traveled with backpack only the whole time. So I didn't have any luggage um, in the hold. And uh, <laughs> they're like, whatever. They basically, they didn't say whatever, but they clearly kind of signed that, you know, it's domestic in Cambodia. What are you going to do? So I'm like, okay, <laughs> so that was really nice. Um, and and then you are in a, in a, in this domestic bit and there's clearly room. So you see there was a refurbishment that has been done because there are like empty stores where they could be like a coffee shop or like a, maybe not duty-free, but like 
amenities, whatever. But no, not there's nothing. There's just a tiny coffee in the center, which is a very nice coffee, I must say. But so you clearly feel that probably, you know, this con French consortium was supposed to keep going and then was interrupted when Cambodia decided to go with the Chinese and they left it there. And they, since they're going to do a new airport, probably they could say, you know, this one, we don't care. So it was, uh, it was kind of new, but empty. And we were like, a, not a lot of passengers, not a very big route. And we waited, 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 waited for that ATR 72500 to arrive, which already arrived on time. It was super, super <laughs> yeah. We had to um, take a bus for 20 meters. Like, oh, wow. You, you go. I'm like, I can see the plane. Like, what? Okay. I enter the bus. So the bus goes like for literally 35 seconds. And then, oh, you can exit. I'm like, really? <laughs> anyway, uh, the ticket was very interesting because that's why I asked you earlier about your ticket experience. When I bought, I bought through Cambodian Anchor Air website. So I find a ticket, I buy it, and then I receive an email. So I pay for it and I receive an email. First email is like, thank you for uh, the booking. The second email is, thank you for your payment. And the third email is, we're now reviewing your ticket. So they didn't issue a ticket for two days. Two days later, I got uh, an approval. <laughs> We've reviewed and approved your ticket. Now you can get it. That, that was like, what? That was very what? weird. Ah, so, I didn't have any of that. Uh, but it shows you maybe that the, it's a bit, not a very big operation, that maybe no. they, 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 there's some guys a queue of tickets and like, uh, oh, good, approved, approved, approved. And he, so it was all fine. It, I'm not here. It's not a criticism. So it was a very weird uh, experience to buy a ticket. I'm like, am I? Did I pay the, it and I get a ticket? Or the issue gone? I had with them, so that second flight I booked directly with them, and I got the email through saying it's all been confirmed and you get that six, those six letters that you have yes, reservation yes. code, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I could never go on to my booking. I didn't try, to be honest. Yeah, could never go on it. So I'm thinking, have I booked? Have I booked through some random website and have had my money stolen? <laughs> yeah, it's not there. Yeah. None, none of that. Yeah, the website is very basic. Yeah. Yeah, let's yeah. put it that way, yeah. But, oh, and also, yeah, I didn't realize. So, so when they gave me the, so because I had to go to, check in to actually get a proper boarding pass not a, you could do nothing online obviously it said on my boarding pass premium economy and i'm like i didn't buy premium economy or maybe i did i didn't realize it because it was it was a sold nearly sold out flight and because i booked super late maybe that was what was only remaining was that i don't know but uh, so i'm like what does that work a premium economy on an atr uh, so, so basically the thing that it gives you is, as many of you know, you board the ATR from the back because there's cargo in the front. So there's the door for the passengers is in the back. So the seats we had were the very last ones. The, the last three rows of seats for, was for premium economy. Actually, the very last one were for the crew to sit down and have a rest while the flight was going on. So I was the last to board and the first to deplane. So I guess that's what you get. Because otherwise, like you, the water didn't feel appealing at all. So I was like, no, 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 no. And it, the flight is really, it's 25 minutes from Phnom Penh to Siem Reap. So 25, it's really nothing. Uh, and then SIA, so probably- so, Sorry, go, going back to that flight. Yeah, yeah. Did you use the toilet? No, because I, I last time I flew an ATR was maybe lot. Uh, probably 2018, 16, I don't remember, like maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, the toilets are pretty narrow. It was funny because my wife went to the loo. She's going to hate me when she listens to this. But <laughs> she, went, she went off to the loo and she came back and she sat down and she said to me, um, you can't use the toilet. I'm like, has she, has she blocked it up in some way, shape or form? What, what she, I was like, what have you done to it? And she no, no, it's not like that. I went, well, why can't you use the toilet? She went, because you won't fit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't check I, then again the flight was only 25 minutes but yeah, yeah it's uh, I think no one went actually because again it's a very very short flight um, so the first impression of Siem Rep is probably had the same it's huge mm -hmm. it's empty and that's on arrival because we'll talk about it later when we departed but I was like this thing is massive also, because you arrive with an ATR-72, it's, it's tiny. So you're like this little dot in this massive apron. And then we had to deplane and walk. And when I walk, I took a few pictures. You see the number of gays with jetties mm -hmm. 
is massive, and we're the only aircraft. Yeah, and you're like, us, what yeah. the hell? The size of that thing. And, I mean, it's great. I love again infrastructure plays like this. Is I'm impressed by them, but <laughs> like in this tiny aircraft, lost in the middle of this huge airport, uh, the, the the feeling was really kind of impressive. And then you probably had the same. You walk in, there's this corridor, and you arrive at the belts for the domestic. It's pretty efficient. Uh, then again, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of pressure because I was we were the only flight. And uh, off you go. You, you have this door. You go out, and we had a driver waiting for us, and that was it. But uh, it felt uh, it felt oversized. Something that uh, I felt again when leaving. But I want to hear about your arrival. Do you feel the same way? Exactly the same. We landed, uh, pulled up, literally as close as you could get to the terminal building because I can't put an air bridge up for a seventy-two. Uh, got off straight into the uh, baggage hall. Uh, three, I think there were two or three carousels for domestic flights. Yeah, that's it, I think. And yeah. the bags were off in minutes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, you look at it. And, and I, I was really surprised because I, you, you sort of WhatsApp me and said, you know, it's a new big airport. Yeah, you have the experience of the old one because you've been to the old one, right? Yeah. Uh, again, when I did Vietnam the last trip in 2006, I went to the old one. Um, and it was quite small. But it was absolutely fine for the passengers. But the reason, though, uh, 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 we were talking to one of our guides and they said, yeah, the, the new airport opened in November last year. Yeah, it's a new city. Um, but the reason be it, one, the Chinese wanted to invest, but the old airport was too close to the temples of Angkor Wat, so the vibration was doing damage. Yeah, I've read because I was also surprised. I mean, first of all, as soon as I heard China, I said, okay, well, they're doing a lot of infrastructure plays in the region, so f fair enough. And I also understand that the, the Cambodia, especially when you have Vietnam, you have Thailand, they want to compete for the tourism market, mm -hmm. so they want to improve their uh, their infrastructure. So fair enough, I totally understand. And they also invest for the future, which if you look at the numbers of people going to Siem Reap and Angkor Wat, it basically opens in the 90s because it's post-war, post, you know, the, the whole civil war, Pol Pot, there was also a coup yeah. in the end of the 90s. I had a I had a chance to go like end of the nineties I think it was ninety nine and I didn't which I always regretted so I'm very happy to have seen it this time and it was very few tourists which is very thank God I was very happy because I hate over tourism but anyway I read what me like you I was like very curious and I was reading that indeed it was too close to the temples that there was not only the the, the disruption because of the friction but there was also uh, there's a lot of air pollution, which is also, by the way, also the, you know, the, the rickshaws, the tuk-tuk. Also, yeah. you know, the, because they have these old things that came probably the, the third end market from South Korea or whatever. So there, there's a lot of good reasons to remove. And also simply the, the noise, the sights, the fact that you're visiting Angkor and you see a plane might not be very respectful to the, the entire area. And it was kind of, yeah, I should have said that as well. It's kind of locked by the city. It's not, Siem Reap is not a big city, guys. It's nothing to do with Phnom Penh. It's more like a village that became big because of the tourism and the attraction of the temples. But th there was not a lot of room for expansion. Although some locals tell me that if they want to expand, they can clearly just uh, tell people, get out and we'll expand it any way we want. So, But until then, you know, it was like, okay, pollution, you know, environment, noise. Uh, there was a lot of good reasons and investment in the future. But it was upon, upon returning to Siem Reap Airport, SIA, which is also f f funny, the, the old airport used to be to have the IATA code REP, uh, like REP, and the new airport is SIA, Siem Reap International Airport, SIA. They added the international bit, I guess they want to you know, attract. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that I realized that before, so they have this huge highway, motorway that they've built from Siem Reap to the new airport. It's far, right? It's like, how long did it take to, to get to the city? It's about an hour to drive yeah. For, uh, yeah, from the center of the city. Which for a small for a small city, it's it's kind of a big undertaking. It's brand yeah. new. That road is probably the best in the entire country. Yeah, I mean, if we had roads like that in Britain, we'd be happy. <laughs> yes, right? Yes. And you often have to pay a toll, so some of the drivers are unhappy because you have to pay a toll. Of course, they put the debt on your on, on your tap, your 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 bill as a as a visitor. But on the side of all this terrain that was there, new airport city, and there's already one or two buildings. And I was asking the drivers, like, what is that? And the guy said, well, when 
this huge consortium came and decided to build this new airport, they not only took the rights of the airport, the entire area, which is fields now, is going to be a city. And he told me first, in Siem Reap proper, so in the town, if you want, they cannot build higher than the temples themselves. So the city is pretty low. And again, the city is a big, a big word. It's a town. It's a big town. But also, and that's when he said that word, I understood everything. He said casino. I'm like, okay. So they're going to go for an entire city which is going to have entertainment, casinos, hotels, and clearly will be for the Chinese market. Yeah. And again, I get it. It's not a criticism I make. You know, they need uh, uh, tourism money. There's, I, I think it, tourism is not even their biggest, it's still agriculture, I think, their biggest source of income in that country. So I get it. But that's that's certainly all the pieces fit together why they have such a big airport. Because the airport is like 15 million people or whatever. I don't remember that. But it's it's huge. It's oversized mm. for what it is. There, right? there must have been, what, 30 gates? Yes. Yeah. I think I, I read until, I think at least 27, 28, because I remember that number when I was looking at it. And yep. by the way, I don't know if you, s you remember that, when you go back to that airport, there are sets of gates on the right, on the left, in front of yep. you. The one on the left were completely closed. They were cordoned off, so they're not in use. The one on the right, there's one that is being used, and I think it's only Vietnam Airlines, meaning that these gates are like future-proof. It's like when we'll have traffic, well, but there's no amenity whatsoever on this on this side. There's only in the central bit when they, they have this, uh, there's a coffee, there's a Burger King. <laughs> it's huge, right? I mean, yeah, uh, yeah. It's go massive. on, because uh, maybe I, I don't want to preempt what you wanted to say about it, but if, what, what impression did you have there? I, I thought it was a really, really good airport, but it yes. was just, it was just empty. I yes. mean, when, when we flew in, we were the only aircraft there. When we yes. flew out, we were the only aircraft there. I had two. There was, I mean, I saw two, uh, a 321 from Vietnam leaving and a 320 also for Vietnam Air actually arriving. That's uh, that's about it. The oh, good no, thing is that you can, you have these views everywhere. You can see views of the apron. You can see part yep. of the runway. So it's nice. It's very airy. It's yeah. very bright. It's uh, when I checked in the... The uh, two hours too early as well, and uh, when I checked in, the, the the lady said, "Oh, the downstairs cafe is closed." And I'm like, well, "I don't even know there's," that. and I understood because I was on a, I don't know if it's the case as well on that pier that the one that is being heavily used. Yeah, there's a there's a ground floor which is for the, the for the flights when you need to walk. Yeah, and that's where I was. It probably you were as well. Yeah. So there will be a cafe, which is closed, but we stayed at the one at the top. Yeah. Which is really nice. I mean, there's uh, lots of, um, what was it? There was the usual, you know, the uh, the sh beauty shops. Everything was overpriced. I didn't buy anything, but I went, you know, souvenir shops, uh, duty-free, the usual thing. Uh, there was uh, like this food area. One name appealed to me, Dim Sum Emperor. I'm like, hmm, I want better. I didn't, I didn't know. I wasn't hungry at that time. We just went for the cafe. And there's this, uh, they also built like, you've seen it in the middle, this four-faced Brahma statue, like in gold yep. or something. <laughs> That's very impressive in the middle. It's, it acts a bit like the yellow plush toy at uh, Doha Airport, like uh, something to, a lot of people were taking pictures and selfies in, in front of that one. So yeah, it's, it's. Uh, did you go into the lounge? Did you try it? No. Same not. No. Same. Uh, we didn't. We didn't use a lounge, so we flew out of there with Bangkok Airways. Same, yeah. Um, but we we got to the airport two hours before our flight. Uh, I think we were the first flight out of the day. I seem to recall. But the the queue, the oh. check in. Oh man, the check in. Really? They were so. I've never come across something oh, hey. like that where they were so shit hot on weight, and and it was because the flight oh, wow. was full. Okay. But literally, they were uh, they were weighing your hand luggage, they were weighing bags, they were measuring the size of suitcases. Wow. And it's like, oh, my good God. Oh. And, and it took forever to check in. Um, Is it because you also flew an ATR and maybe they wanted to make sure that people... Was it an ATR you flew back yeah, to? Yeah, yeah, ATR too, yeah. Because ATRs are very narrow um, overhead bins. Yeah. So they want to make sure that people are not trying to maybe, you know, get stuff that they shouldn't be. Okay. Yeah, I oh. don't know, but they took an age to... Oh, I didn't have that experience. Uh, it was very uh, fast for me. Was, yeah, uh, but we were too it. early. Uh, we were not the first flight nor the last flight. But I mean, again... Another sign of that airport being uh, oversized for currently. Um, I'm not yeah. criticizing the, the the size. I'm just saying there were these boards. I think there was five screens. You know the usual screen. Yeah, yeah. Like, and the first board, the only board that they were all working, but only the first board shown flights. But there was four on the. So not even half of the first screen was flights for the day. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. like five well, because you, you flew out 
late afternoon, didn't he? Uh, yes. And but then again, there was no other flight. I mean, there was another flight, but meaning, again, no sense of size compared to the, uh, I mean, I, I get it, right? But it's just impressive. And it's nice to see a brand new airport like this. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, do you want to say a few words maybe before we go to our flights about uh, Siem Reap and your experience there? Did you like it? You know, I loved it. I, I yeah. thought Siem Reap was, was, was great. Uh, yeah. The nice. the whole going to see the temples is yeah, is fantastic. Yeah, one of the wonders of the world. Yeah, it is. Siem Reap itself, uh, the town is Fun. is lovely. Loads of bars and restaurants. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Pub Street Pub is uh, is interesting, but you know what you you can buy what you want in Siem Reap. You know, you've got you've got the night markets there, and yeah, if you want your um, genuine fake stuff, yeah, yeah, that's the place to go and get it. Yeah, yeah. restaurants were great, and they had cuisine from again all over the world. So. I think we were there. Were we there three nights? So I think one night we had Asian food. One night we had Greek food. Yeah, I know. I know it's exactly. A great, really, really good Greek restaurant. So it was a Greek owner. You texted me. Oh, I'm going for Greek. I'm like, I saw it. I'm like, I'm not going, but I saw it. <laughs> yeah. And then the last night we went to the pizza restaurant that you had recommended, uh, which is this little pop up <laughs> place yes. owned by by a couple from Texas. Are they from Texas? I didn't talk enough to... Oh, that explains yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. But he remember, or the lady that was serving us, because obviously you recommended it, so we went along a week or so after you'd be, and then uh, she just got talking to us, and she said, oh, where are you guys from? So we said, London. And I said, uh, we had some friends here a couple of weeks ago, and he recommended it, and she said, oh, right, what do you look like? And then she remembers talking to you. <laughs> yeah, we had a Because obviously little you little and chat. I stand out somewhat. Yeah, well, but, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So for us, it was the only time when we went west, and I was like, "Okay, yeah." I, I saw that pizza place, and like, I just want tonight uh, uh, something different. And the, the pizza was really, really, really good. Yeah, it was good. It was yeah. Really, really good. We happened to be at a, some kind of spring light festival that happened the same. So we stayed five, six days. So we stayed kind of a, a, a bit longer, and uh, <laughs> it was the chaos the people out it was it was fun though it was really fun our hotel was thankfully a bit remote we, we like our yeah, quietness and yeah, privacy but out, yeah. it was uh no it was nice and, I, and again i said it earlier that the temples i had had the opportunity to go just after the the war ended uh no maybe not just after but like at the end of the 90s with the where the country started to reopen for tourism and i didn't so i'm very happy to have seen them and also i think you shared that there was not a lot of tourists it was really I was really happy. Probably you had even less tourists when you went 16 years ago, but it was really almost empty and I was happy about that. Not the yeah. usual images of, uh, yeah. Our guide was saying that tourism is, is it, it hasn't come back after COVID. Yeah. yeah. Whereas Vietnam is pretty much back to, to what it pre-COVID was. numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah our our really guide said that as well. It, it's true. Having said what I just said, Obviously, I'm not happy for the people they're working in that in the tourism industry, which is most of the people in Siemra, basically, because obviously they're suffering. We, I, I'm gonna, I had a because I had to find um, a tuk tuk driver, a rickshaw driver, Mr. Cat, uh, tuk Cambodia.com. Guys, this guy is awesome. If you ever want to visit, because you need a tuk tuk. I mean, you could do biking, but it would be crazy with the heat there. Uh, you need a rickshaw tuk tuk driver if you want to have a guide i'm not the type of people to have a guide because you know for me i like i do photography and i, and I see the things but i don't want someone to explain me for five hours the meaning of every single thing i see but as a driver mr cat tuk tuk cambodia.com uh great guy and i made our trip you know this the i don't know if it's your feeling as well and then we'll go back to to finish this episode to go back to to, to flying but i love the people in cambodia they were really kind and nice they're they're probably my favorite people in in the whole region um, yeah, they were really enough nice. for you. although that said vietnamese were also the same yeah they're very nice um, that's true yeah really down to earth and again i think you know they it, it, what it shows is is how much money tourism brings into those countries and and they want you to have a fabulous experience yes. so you go away and you tell your friends and your family you've got to go to these places or you, you know do a podcast yeah. um and uh, yeah, i thoroughly recommend it and and you know vietnam is um is 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 uber trendy at the moment in the yes. tourism world but cambodia you know it's right next door if you're going to do a trip pop into cambodia as well i, yeah. I make it sound very easy and straightforward and actually you know what it is it is because when you go you, if you go to bangkok like we just did and then that's exactly where we go now go back to bangkok but it's very quick you're there mm-hmm. and if you 
you might not want to do non pen because as I said, it's not touristy. It's like, I, I like chaos and rough stuff. So that was, uh, my better half told me, okay, that's for you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But uh, you can go to the South to have your retreat that you did on, on, on the beach, but at least only do Siem Reap, the temples. You could do like three weeks. By the way, there is, that's one thing that maybe it's, it's nice to know next to the, Airport, the new airport, which is far again, it's an hour from the, the, the town, the Siem Reap proper. There is another set of temples that are not fully uh, yet restored. It's always a debate, you know, even there they say some, you see some temples are restored, not fully, not exactly what they looked like probably uh, uh, centuries ago, but they're restored some are there are more the nature is still there. So you have this interaction that makes it kind of a more like an Indiana Jones movie style. Those ones next to the airport, next 20 minutes from the airport are worth it. There's one, uh, of course, when I want to say it, I completely forgot the name. It doesn't really matter. But because you anyway go to the airport, especially in a time like us, we were going, uh, our flight was leaving, I think at 6 p.m., uh, 5.30. I said, you know what? Since we're going to drive an hour anyway, let's drive an hour and 20 minutes, go to that temple, check that temple, and then come to the airport, which probably if the airport hadn't been there, I, I'm not sure I would have, in the time that I had in, in, in Siem Reap, I would have done it. It's uh, So it opens another part of Siem Reap that is interesting to to see, guys. If, you, if you're interested in two temples, you can do that. Let's go back to flying. So... Uh, how did you like, because for you, it was your first Bangkok Airways experience. Mm -hmm. How was it? So compared to uh, Cambodian Angle Air, the aircraft was much more modern. And again, like you, really surprised. We got, we got, we got a meal yeah. for an hour and hour's flight. And, um, and we, we left CM Reap, I think it was about quarter to 10 in the morning. And they came round with chicken, potatoes and vegetables. Just what you want at quarter to ten in the morning, but it was really good. Um, full service, you could have you know they came around with a drinks trolley as well, um, and and it was just a, you know all seater economy, really really good. But we left, I think we left CM Reap half an hour earlier than scheduled. Same, I, I guess there's no one at the airport. Everyone's at the gate. Get them on. Yes. Get them gone. Yes. Um, yes. Which was great, and then we got back to Bangkok. I think an hour earlier than we were due to arrive. So I think it, it proves something. I mean, this year, this was the first set of flights I've done in this calendar year. But last year, I did lots of flights around Europe. Yeah. And I didn't have one flight that was on yeah. time or early. That doesn't happen. You need to follow track, big boys in, in Europe. You need to see what these guys do in Asia because they, they've got it They've got it down to a T. Yeah, um, but but yeah, back, back to Bangkok. Um, so we ended up having, I think, nearly three hours in the lounge at, uh, at Bangkok. Different lounge to the one we used when we flew out. Uh, much bigger, um, but yeah, great. Empty. Uh, very few people in there. And then, uh, we f then we were called to gate. So we got to the gate for our triple seven back to um, London with Ty. Yeah. And we were then held in the gate for probably about an hour and a quarter. What? And yeah, they just pinned it, put everybody in there and it wasn't ready to board. Um, okay. I don't know if there was a problem or what yeah. it was, but it was, it was so hot. <laughs> there was no air conditioning in this particular <laughs> gate. The sun was beaming through the glass. It was roasting. Wow. And everyone was starting to get a bit tetchy. Um, and then we, then we got on the flight and uh, had champagne before we took off this time. Nice. Uh, which was great. Uh, cabin crew again, really attentive. The the 777 on the way home had clearly had a, a refurbishment because everything looked more modern inside. Different buttons for the seat setting and stuff, which were... Uh, more obvious, so you could actually read what it said on the buttons rather than have been scratched <laughs> off by overuse. Uh, so that was great. But the uh, the uh, cabin crew manager came round and introduced herself to everybody and sort of taking orders for for the menu before we took off. And uh, she said, oh, the flight's, um, flight's meant to be 12 hours, but it's going to be much longer than that, so we won't worry about the time. And I'm like, oh, my oh. God, what the heck? Oh. Um, and then she said, we're going to serve uh, lunch an hour after takeoff and then the second meal five hours later what and i uh, this is a bit weird what, what's that about normally you sort of get fed two hours before landing don't yes you? so um anyway she took the order for both and then so we ate and again a, a nice meal fell asleep uh it was a day flight back uh fell asleep then woke up again to have this the second meal five hours later 
and then we we were just wondering why they'd woken us up when it's like you know nine thirteen hours back and then it became quite obvious why they'd served us early we had really bad turbulence uh, literally for the second leg uh, or second half of the flight the flight yeah um and yeah the seatbelt sign was pretty much on for six hours yeah wow yeah we had a uh, we had as well some uh what what's your what do you think was it still Was it a night flight? Or was it a day flight? No, day flight. So we left Bangkok okay. at lunchtime, their time, and got back to Heathrow at seven o'clock in the evening. Well, we were meant to get back at seven o'clock in the evening. We got back about half past eight in the end. Did the pilot ever came on to explain the turbulence situation? Yep. He so he'd do an announcement, then turn on the seatbelt sign, and then the cabin crew would then do the same announcement again. <laughs> and there was a fair few times of that. And then for the second half of the flight, it was just on pretty much continuously and wow. the cabin crew were sat down. Um, I, I found turbulence in business class when you're trying to sleep actually quite therapeutic. It was like being rock cradled to sleep, whereas my <laughs> wife was like, no, nah, I'm not having this. I can't sleep because it's bumpy. But I I slept for I, probably of that 13 hours, I probably slept for 10 Oh, wow, man, same experience. The reason I'm asking is because I don't really care about turbulences. Uh, ours was a night flight, the Etihad, which I'll explain in the next episode. We're already far beyond the two hours mark, but I don't really care because we're having a good conversation. Uh, the It says a night flight. So I was thinking, would you like the pilot to wake you up with an announcement in mid when you're sleeping, besides the it push your, your yeah. seatbelt? Or or not? Would you prefer to have the captain, the pilot, the first officer to come and say something about the upcoming uh, turbulence, or just an announcement that there's turbulence and that's it? What you do you prefer? I, I think yeah, there's turbulence coming up. I think you want to be warned it's coming, just in case you are yeah. awake. Yeah, and not not have the feeling you're just going to drop out of the sky. <laughs> Because uh, my wife, she was like, they never told us. This is true. They they they, they just did the, the, the announcement to put the the, 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 the seat belts, but it was not really. Uh, she even said uh, that the pilot should have come on the PA and said, keep hope alive. I'm like, no, you don't say that. <laughs> don't say stuff like that. No, 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 no. No, 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 no at all. No, you, you kind of want to know it's coming. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. If you're, uh, you know, if, if you fly, not even necessarily frequently, but you know, turbulence exists. So it shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't know about your experience of turbulence. Is turbulence getting worse? Yes. I'm pretty yeah, sure it I, is. I think it is. Maybe... I don't know if it's worse, but at least it happens more often. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's the, the, it, it would be more an exception, and now I find it uh, happening more and more. Yeah. I've, mm. I've had worse, and uh, this file will come to the next episode, but there was nothing. I mean, it was there were turbulences, but nothing, yeah. you know, to... But yeah, it seems that it happens more and more. Yeah, and I mean, there are there are many many studies that are made that you know climate change is affecting the winds and affecting you know the the pockets of hot air and and mm -hmm. and, 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 and and warm air and um, sorry cold air and that it creates more turbulence occurrences. I, I I don't know. I'm not a specialist. I'm not a scientist. But yeah, I have that same feeling. I will. Because then I will ask two questions and I'll let you go because you want to have dinner. <laughs> He's been with me, stuck with me for the past two and a half hours or nearly four hours. Oh, no, I've eaten already. I, I knew <laughs> this was going to go on, so I, I ate in advance. <laughs> Good. So, because I just wanted to mention one more thing about if anyone goes to CM Rep International's SIA, uh, there are terraces uh, uh, because people especially listen to this podcast, love to watch planes. There's no observation decks, but they all the smoking lounges, and I put that in big brackets, are actually terraces. There's almost no one smoking. Uh, I've, I've not seen anyone, but there's like multiple ones. You hey. go out and you can see, uh, or plus for me, it was uh, the evening, so the, the, the air was... Uh, not at 35 Celsius <laughs> like the rest of the time. Uh, it was really nice to see, almost empty obviously, but to see a little bit of action. So that's a tip for me. And the other tip I'll say is I've not done the lounge like you. However, I know that the lounge is not not a single view because he's, he's, he's in the wrong part of the airport. He, probably the views are on the parking lot or something. So it's maybe not your uh, the point. Uh, you could access it for $35. I didn't even try because there are... The airport was empty and the rest was great. Anyway, uh, I flew as well, Bangkok Airways. I flew with the ATR 72-600 this time. I will say, you know what? The Cambodian Encore Air had more leg room than the Bangkok Airways ATR. Not that I was completely squished or whatever, but it was a bit uh, better. Uh, I, I, I like the ATR myself. 
as a propeller plane. It's better than a Dash 8. That thing makes too much noise. The ATR is nice. Um, I was also in the back again. I changed this time, knowing that it was an ATR, I changed my seat in the back so I could uh, go out quickly. Uh, and like you, uh, left 20 minutes early, landed 40 minutes early, which was not the greatest news because... Our layovers were already planned to be five hours. It only became five hours and 40 minutes. Oh, no. But went back to the Oman Air Lounge because as I had uh, checked that temple next to the airport, I hadn't had time to shower. Uh, so I wanted to shower be before the big flights home. Uh, the name of the temple is Prasat Beng Mealia. Prasat Beng Mealia, close to that new airport. So yeah, uh, o o Oman Air, and then uh, and then the rest I'll talk in the next episode because I think we, we've been long enough about it. So it was nice to, for me, the first time in Cambodia, not for you. Um, so uh, I was very happy as you were. I will. Uh, I know that the, the longer podcast doesn't matter. Our audience knows there's a pause button if you want to come back to. I'll spend another 10 minutes just to ask you, obviously, the question I ask to every single person that comes on this podcast. I want to know, what is your most memorable flight? And I know that you've uh, put one aside for us. So I want to hear about it. Uh, so, yeah, it's the, it was that KLM flight, actually. Um, the, the the pilot telling us about the, you know, the really old plane that we were going to fly across oh. the Atlantic on. And then... Uh, and then this uh, emergency episode and the uh, yeah the, the the methodology of trying to find a doctor on a flight um, that that was probably my most memorable uh, my worst ever flight um, <laughs> was with an airline called Wamos Air which oh. you you know about oh man what happened a couple of years ago I uh, we went on a, a package holiday to Mexico. Okay. Um, so we flew with Tui. Uh, on the way out, we had a Dreamliner seven eight seven eight hundred. Um, travel premium economy. Great, really, really good flight. Uh, cabin crew great. Lots of legroom in premium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Coming back, uh, we were. I I found out that uh, Tui's uh, aircraft had gone in for maintenance, so they chartered a alternative airline called Wamos Air, which is a Spanish airline. Uh, it was, it was just, it was just awful. It's just, so look at just, right dr just dreadful. This, uh, we had an A330 home, no premium economy. The seats, the narrowest seat I have ever, Gosh, ever been on, shit. uh, oh, for man. a 12 hour flight. Uh, we man. weren't sat next to one another. Uh, the cabin crew spoke very little English. Wow. That doesn't help. Yeah really turbulent as well so you really did feel like your life was in uh, was going to come to an end at some point um and and to crown it all they ran out of water oh no way yeah oh come so on I, I got up about six hours to go got up and just said can i have a cup of water no sorry i've run out no come on i mean that's not acceptable no and they said oh but we have soft drinks oh, i'll have a soft drink oh no you have to pay for that oh, I... what oh come on again it's it was, it was, they were just, that was shocking. Worst ever flight. So th this airline literally exists to uh, help out other airlines. Uh, yeah. If you ever yeah. do yeah. a flight and it comes up, wham, or say it, just don't board it. <laughs> it doesn't do your blood pressure any good whatsoever. Uh, I cannot, it, it, yeah, but it is but the worst flight I have ever, ever had. And, uh, and a flight I will never, ever forget. Oh, yeah, well, I'm honest. sure you will not forget. The other flight you will never forget, the other, if we can do briefly, let's do two, three more minutes. Because it's, you know, we're April 2024. Four years ago, we were in lockdown, stupid oh. lockdowns. I mean, we we all remember this. We don't want to remember this, depending on your point of view. However, you were one of those who were on a trip <laughs> when suddenly... You know, the border started to close, the lockdown started to be a thing. They were not still implemented, but they were like, and where, where were you when that happened? Uh, so we were, we did a trip to Singapore, Borneo, and Bali. So we flew out on the 6th of March, 2020. Um, we considered whether we should cancel the trip, but the advice from the British government was it's still safe to do so. So if we cancelled, we'd lose everything. So we flew. Uh, we had a great time in Singapore. Uh, very few people out there. Great trip. Then we went to Borneo and then went to Bali. Um, and we were due to fly back on the Monday, the 23rd of March. Um, I think it was on the 18th or the 19th. 
Uh, we were flying back with Garuda to Singapore and then uh, picking up a BA flight from Singapore to London. Uh, we discovered that uh, we could no longer go through Singapore uh, because the Singaporean authorities had closed down the fact that even if you were just picking up your bag to then recheck in, you had to do 14 days quarantine. Oh, my God. And it's like, oh, shit, what do we do now? <laughs> uh, so there was lots of frantic toing and froing with our insurance company and, and, and other airlines and BA looking at trying to get an alternative route. BA, BA were useless. They were like, <laughs> the flight's still going. It's like, the flight's still going, but we can't get on it. <laughs> and they didn't care. Uh, so we ended up forking out, I think it was close to £3,000 to fly with Singapore Airlines. Sure. So we could just transit through Singapore. Didn't have to pick up a bag, somebody yeah. check in, which you were allowed to do. Uh, thankfully, our, our insurance paid for it. But uh, yeah, uh, we wow. got back to the UK on the uh, 21st of March. Landed at Heathrow with all the crises, you know, the lack of toilet roll and pasta and God knows what in supermarkets. And it, we'd only been away two weeks. It felt like we'd been away for about 10 years. It was, it, we, ca we came back to an alternative universe. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, it's the end. Thank you so much, Paolo, for having done that with me. I know it's a bit longer than usual, but I really love, I mean, you can, guys, you can see, he's a close friend of mine. So these are the kind of discussions we usually have at the pub yep. in front of a not one, but many beers. Uh, so this was one that was actually recorded. So I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. I'll probably have him back at some point. Uh, whilst I play the music, actually, I will say I pretend to play the music because I'm sure it's also mid music like I did earlier because I was playing with the sound before we started recording. So I'll add it in post. Do you have any either flights coming up soon or any other big trips in the plans that you're going to make me uh, jealous uh, no, about? No big trips in the plans. Uh, next flight is actually July. Uh, so we've got two two trips one weekend after the other. So we're going down to Toulouse in southwestern France for oh, a long yes. weekend for the rugby uh, to go and watch the rugby. Yeah. Uh, but also, we want to try and get a visit to the Airbus factory. No, oh, nice. And then the following weekend, a long weekend in Mallorca. So fly down to Parma. That's perfect. That's for me, guys. And then, oh, so go on. And then, you're flying tomorrow, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm flying tomorrow. Like it's, uh, what is it? It's nearly 9 p.m. I have to wake up at uh, 5 because one of these very early BA flights to Nice for uh, happy birthday, Marcus. He's going 50. So I'm going three days near Nice for that. It's going to be good weather. Uh, maybe not as good as Cambodia or Mallorca where you're going, but it's going to be nice. I hope that BA is going to be nice. I, I It's a BA, you know, uh, Euro, what's the name? The new one from Gatwick. The, oh, Euroflyer. Yeah, it's. I, I hope it's going to be nice. Uh, I, I'm still gold for another, wow, shoot, five days. I think I'm going to lose my gold. So I was able to grab uh, emergency exits, which is why I took BA instead of taking uh, EasyJet. On that, again, Paolo, unless you have any closing words you want to say, thank you so much for having that with me. Ah, thanks for having me. It's been great. And uh, happy flying. Angie, speak soon.